tragedy. Even today, there was an article about a study, and it has not hit the establishment. Since we are just discussing, I think the cost of inaction, somebody has to make a good report on what happened to children, what would happen to also future of economy, democracy. This is what is happening to 70% of children in the country. Uh, is there something going on? I see a screen with. We have Professor Ramanujam also with us and uh, so Raju is also here. So we are actually ready to begin, but maybe we'll wait a minute more so that it's 3.15. Welcome, Shantaji. Thank you. People are still joining, so we'll just give them a minute more. Gita Nambisan had joined, but in the audio only more. She's joining again. Uh, yeah, I think we can uh, begin now uh, because, anyway, I'll make the introductory remarks and. Uh, I'll set the context, which people are already familiar, so we will start right away. So welcome all of you to the second plenary meeting of the National Coalition on the Education Emergency. Uh, you, some of you will recall that we had the first meeting in July last year, and uh, at that time, uh, we were trying to see if we are, we, people can come together and uh, discuss the em education emergency and also see what is it that uh, we can collectively do about it. So uh, I won't go into the details of what all we have been able to do in the last uh, 10 months or so. We have done quite a few things, but of course, it's, I would say, uh, just a speck uh, compared to what we really need to be doing. But uh, there is hope and we have been at it on different aspects, including the social mobilization, education support, and research to support both. And uh, uh, Therefore, I won't go into the details of that. Today's uh, plenary is really focusing primarily on um, where we are right now and what is it that we need to do. And uh, the idea is really to get idea. The objective really is to get everybody's ideas. So we have given maximum time for the open sessions, but we also thought it would be useful to have some element of uh, some uh, aspect of sharing by a couple of people who have uh, been engaged with the education emergency in quite some detail over the last year and even more and uh, therefore we have professor ramanujam who will uh, speak immediately after i finish and he will uh, focus including on the experience from tamil nadu on the academic and the pedagogic possibilities that uh, he sees that the coalition needs to engage with and after that we'll have uh, sri raju who has been um, working and advocating on issues relating to uh, Dalits for a long time and he will bring in perspectives on how the education has affected uh, the marginalized groups and what is it that we can do there. Immediately after that, very briefly, we have a set of slides which we'll talk about, in which Sajita will talk about the real problem that the emergency is, some of the things we are aware of and at the same time, there are some elements that we may not be completely aware of. So we, Sajita will talk briefly about that. Then between 4 to 4.45, we'll have... Uh, uh, more analysis of what is happening and some suggestions. And after that, 4 to 4.45 for around 10 minutes or so, Sajita will again talk about what is it, some initial ideas that we have going forward from uh, this point in time. And again, we'll have open discussions after that. So I'll just stop now because uh, I think we are eager to hear Professor Ramanujam. And uh, Professor Ramanujam, uh, Anusha, have we given the presenter access to him? In case he wants to show some... Uh, Professor Ramanujam, would you like to show? 
Uh, yeah, I have given I have given presenter access. You should be able to yeah, see yeah. a screen okay. share option at the yeah. bottom. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. Just a moment. Yeah, yeah. Welcome, Professor Ramanujam. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're so happy you are here with us. Yeah, please go ahead, sir. Yeah, I will. Just a moment. I'll start sharing screen. Uh, if you have a set of slides then we can upload it also that will be even better because then um I see the window is not opening to the, uh, uh, the rightmost extreme next, one second. yeah next to the video button do you see no, no, no. Yeah. Got, it's yeah. Yeah. now yeah now we can see uh no no but i'm getting only the uh, stop sharing i'm not getting the pdf which is open over my right Ah, Have you already opened the PDF? Yeah, yeah. It has come. Yeah. Yeah. It's coming on now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Thanks very much for the opportunity, Guru. Um, yeah. I will start with talking about some recent, you know, in my interactions, a couple of questions that came up. So I thought. Talking about it would set the context. And this is one was uh, from a student and one from a teacher. This was uh, in Kannada Science Forum, we had having discussions with children, my teachers, many contexts. And this was one with a, a group of class nine children. And there was this child from Marikudi named Jay Prakash who said, I thought there would be, I mean, he didn't quite put it this way. I'm trying to para paraphrase what he said. But he said, uh, you know, the schools had reopened. And uh, so he was asking, I thought there would be lessons on lockdown for next time. And then he asked us, will you teach us? Okay, this is, he was basically asking the science forum group. Um, so, and uh, when we had further uh, discussion, we later interaction, we found that his entire family had lost their means of livelihood during 2020-21 and have been um, struggling to re-establish themselves. And here is a child who was uh, asking from that perspective. Um, he was asking uh, um, the, I suppose, I mean, he didn't quite articulate it in this fashion, right? But what he was asking was, um, we went through all this and we have come back from school. Um, why are you not telling us what to do? Right? Uh, this is one. Another one was in a very different context. This was uh, with elementary school teachers. And uh, this was more recent. And this is a teacher, Mary Shalini from Madurai. And she asked, how is it that what I haven't been able to do with 18 years of experience, we expect online videos and videos to do easily. Now, even this articulation is problematic, but you can see that she's assuming that what all the ed tech companies are doing, whatever uh, they are probably doing easily, which is except a very interesting thing. But she's talking about this uh, sudden thing with videos, you know, videos in classroom, smart classroom. There's a lot of all that talk going on, and she was reacting to that. And she was mixing it up with what Baidus is doing, because she's seeing it in advertisements, all that. Now, I wanted to mention this because uh, now these questions brought to my mind that basically, as a society, as a nation, we have not even grasped the magnitude of today's educational crisis. What children are going through, what teachers are going through and the sense of bewilderment. I mean, it's not only about school closing. In Tamil Nadu, schools have reopened and have, have been going on for some time. There have been uh, different courts returned to normalcy. Exams, now uh, vacation is on. Schools are going to reopen on June 3rd. Now, I think the, the sense of bewilderment that I see, I think is what I want to focus on centrally. Uh, now, in terms of challenges, there are many, many challenges that the pandemic has highlighted. And I don't have to talk about it in this group, but 
since guru said you know it's about setting context so i thought you know one is nutrition loss you know, nutrition loss in all age groups due to deprivation and loss of livelihood and long term projections for this now this is a um, you know in, uh, one thing that we have had many discussions about is uh, um, the fact that uh, across the country the noon meal scheme shut down for quite a length of time and then um, even when it uh, actually resumed it was dry rations provided for a very long time and you know what uh, that actually means in terms of nutrition for many access to many children and this also coincided with the time when you know large numbers of uh, people lost livelihoods and so there were uh, families that were utterly uh, uh, reduced to eating very little and uh, in fact there are you know a large number of families with such you know whose uh, only access was the dry rations that the government was provided for school so um, and what this means in terms of long term impact is something that we are beginning to grasp only now and this is something that is a huge challenge and the other one that we have seen again and again is the inability of the system to get localized data and take decisions and uh, tamil nadu uh, during the pandemic actually you know after the initial few months uh, i think the public health system swung into action quite uh, seriously and in fact by um, november 2020 september onwards in fact and there were uh, red districts and green districts and amber districts so there were like you know they were actually going about it in a differentiated fashion with uh, public health strategies for different uh, sections urban areas rural areas but on the other hand when it came to school it was all or nothing it was you know the whole state things were shut down the whole state things were opened and again you know during delta everything was shut down and again uh, uh, no uh, in between there was nothing you know yeah it shut down and then again during omicron everything was shut down there was no lo- you know there was localized data available but as far as the education system was concerned it was state wide action or nothing and now what we have seen even when we resume all the efforts initiatives that are taken invariably it's again state wide action or nothing so this is something that we see very clearly in the system and it's deeply problematic and it has uh, uh, you know the pandemic has highlighted how this thing works and the society's bold exclusive focus on board examinations and interim examinations we saw that during the pandemic that uh, you know there was this uh, big mess with uh, when the exams board exams would take place or not and how it would be calculated what is the formula newspapers carrying it on front page and all that time whether classes were actually happening for 1 to 9 nobody cared or uh, whether online classes happening at the university level what it, whether they were effective so nobody was talking about any of these but uh, you know media everything was highlighting board examinations so clearly the fact that the entire system is about certification and it is about uh, this came to light dramatically during the pandemic and i think uh, this is another thing that, uh, and then the big surge in the pedagogy market the you know what we have we have seen in the opening up of this pedagogy market in a huge way The, and the direct access that educational technology companies have to decision makers across states uh, in delhi everywhere and uh, what uh, they are able they were able to do and what uh, you know how they are entering in a very big way and this is one situation again in tamil nadu we have seen this in the last two years the narrative has changed quite dramatically you know it's not that there was no initiative of this kind earlier at all but Uh, i think the terms of debate have changed and uh, you know there was this uh, tina that uh, the country came up with in the 90s there is no alternative that was to uh, lpg you know liberalization privatization globalization and so on and today the tina is being applied to uh, online education digital uh, you know what digital technology in the classroom the tdp talking about it and especially in terms of using technology for tracking children tracking teachers for collecting data from classroom this is a very uh, big uh, this thing and then uh, you know um, 
ed tech companies offering quick sachet like solutions to various pedagogic problems these are things that we can see and the that now many many more i mean i you know in whatever 15 minutes what i thought was to highlight a few of these central things and uh, now we can i think we'll have more to say and i think all you know in terms of the people gathered here probably there is more experience uh, than any any other uh, group in the country on uh, addressing and acknowledging these challenges and uh, in terms of issue of priorities now given the magnitude of the crisis how do we prioritize our efforts our efforts as a society as uh, the national coalition for uh, on this education emergency now one and here i would like to talk a little bit about the tamil nadu experience is this uh, mobilization of community support for schools now the in august 2021 it started off as a discussion with the tamil nadu government and several groups uh, science forum was involved um, there was this thing that okay schools are going to reopen and there is going to be a crisis at hand and as far as especially primary schools elementary schools are concerned um, what in the school teachers would not be able to cope with the dimension of the challenge and the kind of attention needed and you need uh, community support for that and this you know it was various formulations were talked about and i think it moved into uh, different spheres but finally this elementary kalvi there is this program called elementary kalvi that is formulated and it has been going on for the last uh, several months in the uh, for more than 6 uh, months now um, in uh, several in selected districts but actually for about 4 uh, and a half months in almost all of tamil nadu this re- this is a mobilization of about 1.5 lakh volunteers so there are 1.5 lakh community centers going on these in villages where uh, one or two volunteers um, handling about 20 children or to 30 children in some cases i think i believe the number is much larger in some and smaller in some um, where uh, and the children vary in age group but it's basically a community support center and uh, some uh, units or modules as crt crt prepared the material with uh, support of teachers and uh, this you know it's a bunch of activities and uh, uh, some supplementary educational material that provided but i think from what we hear on the field it's largely run by the enthusiasm of the volunteers and uh, but it has proved to be something that uh, in um, across the state a kind of an acknowledgement from society an acknowledgement and a recognition that uh, in this situation primary education is important and that the community should act i think the, now the need for it is to be articulated in a wide way because across the country we do not see such initiatives and uh, if such support is to be mobilized what is the form it should take what is the content of it now tamil nadu is talking about they have already extended it till october and uh, there is talk that it will go on till december of this year now and then what will happen afterwards we don't know but uh, the fact that one concerted effort for a whole calendar year of this kind from community level is having some effect uh, it's not going uniformly well i mean there we get a lot of mixed reports but the fact is that something like that has taken place another one that i want to talk about is understanding like the examples that i was giving of a child talking about uh, having some expectations you know something like uh, you know you have this huge disruption for a year and a half two years and then you come back to school from class 7 to class 9 and then you expect something to be changed in school and then that boy that's what he was asking you don't even acknowledge the lockdown there are no lessons about lockdown there is no lessons about you know what happened to your family and what you should be doing if there is another one next time right now we are this teacher seeing that suddenly you know this is a teacher from a private school pretty good school a highly reputed one of that and she has been doing this online education on this time and then uh, she sees uh, some videos uh, being promoted and she has actually seen some of them she has participated in some of the effort that SRT is doing right now and she was telling me what is it that uh, 
that these videos are going to do that I have not been able to do with 18 years of my teaching, right? And somehow she thinks that Baijus is actually doing better. And the complete confusion about what all that means, how these new classrooms are going to come. And, uh, but I think we have really not understood. We've talked a lot about learning loss. We have speculated on many of the problems that are there. But to an articulation, clear articulation on the impact of deprivation of schooling and what it means for uh, students and teachers, I believe we have not understood the depth of the problem. And, uh, you know, I would like to see, I mean, I have seen studies that give numbers on various things about how, you know, what schools were uh, doing, where it was closed and what uh, learning loss in some sense in terms of achievement. But after children have come back, after teachers have come back, I have not uh, seen any in-depth study of what is actually being faced by the teachers in school in the classroom. And then what I would say is a large-scale detoxification. You know, we've had a situation in this country where millions of children, uh, literally, um, for about a year and a half, nearly two years, being glued to devices, digital devices for long times. And the kind of toxicity that leaves in the system and uh, what it means for children in terms of their emotional and intellectual well-being, I think, uh, I, I don't think we have uh, even understood, but more importantly, what do we do about it now? This is something that uh, we hear from teachers uh, in uh, all uh, the day. Um, so, yeah. And then, right digitalization, this is a term that I have really learned from uh, this group. Uh, building strength in the strength in the system to respond constructively to the edtech search to articulate how it should be done and how it should not be done and uh, what is the way which we should move forward and uh, this is particularly important in the context of uh, the NEP 2020 and the big push that we see coming from Delhi and lastly the tremendous curricular and pedagogic opportunity that has come up in Tamil Nadu there is this enumeratum scheme which is trying to uh, articulate uh, over the next three years to uh, develop foundational skills, as they call it, basically ensure that all children achieve certain levels of uh, education in primary school. And uh, But uh, it's a fairly open one. It talks about how you move from uh, uh, text-based to uh, children's uh, level-based content and move to alternative pedagogy, assessment only through uh, observation, etc., etc. We'll see how it goes. But the point is that definitely there is a curricular and pedagogic opportunity that has come up. And uh, if uh, whether we can take hold of it and use it as a drive is something that we need to think about. Yeah, so I just wanted to highlight a few issues. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Ramanujam, for that. Uh, we'll have uh, discussions on what you spoke about later, but I'll now welcome uh, Sri Raju to present. Uh, and uh, uh, Anusha, will you open the slides? Thank you. Uh, I would like to compliment the National Coalition on Education Emergency for uh, bringing out these most important issues concerning education at this point of time, because not much is talked about in the country. Though it is a real emergency, it is pity that the kind of seriousness, the kind of urgency, the, uh, the needed focus is not there in the public domain in the country. So it is in this background, your initiative is very valuable. I guess today the country ought to be declaring education emergency, but unfortunately the country seems to have declared archaeology emergency, getting the uh, mosques dug or temples dug to find out something. So that is where we are and we need to really uh, come together more in number to bring out these issues. In the next 10 minutes, I just would like to 
highlight some of the issues concerning the marginalized sections, particularly the Dalits in the context of education. Ramanujam ji has already brought out very clearly as how even in Tamil Nadu, which can really boast of a, a very good educational uh, system in place, they were, they were not really looking at the localized data, localized situation. So there is a, a, a one solution for the entire country. In that kind of a scenario, you can understand how Dalits will be facing severe uh, 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 marginalization in, in the context of education. That is what I would be highlighting. I will not go into many details. I'll be just uh, uh, pointing out certain thoughts for you to consider. Next. <clears throat> Next. Yeah. Uh, uh, the outline of my presentation would be, I would be briefly talking about the reality of the marginalized sections, particularly the Dalits in the context of education, because if you want to understand Dalits and education, you will not be able to understand unless you grasp, acknowledge the reality of Dalits in the society. If you ignore that and try to look at uh, the education of Dalis, you will miss uh, the, the real picture. So we need to understand what is the reality of Dalis. Secondly, I would be talking about what are the particular issues of concern for Dalis and the way forward. Next. <clears throat> Coming to the Dalit reality, I would say when I say Dalit reality, I would like to bring out Dalit truth as opposed to the lies of the caste system. Because Dalit reality is literally in every sphere of life of Dalit, there is a battle between this truth against the lies of the caste system. Whether it is politics, whether it is education, whether it is uh, uh, economic development in every facet of life of Dalit, you would find that there is a conflict between the truth and the lies of the caste system. That is what one has to recognize and understand. And I would like to point out that in the context of education, I have seen very clearly, not only now for so many last uh, a few decades, uh, right from the time when I entered the uh, uh, civil service in, in early 1980s, I've seen very clearly that there is exclusion hiding behind the pretense of inclusion. There is the caste system's DNA is evident in education system. And thirdly, the Dalit reality is, you, you would agree with me that during the freedom struggle, most of the Dalit struggle uh, uh, led by Baba Sahib Ambedkar has been to secure political representation for Dalits. But unfortunately, today, the political representation secured for Dalits in assemblies and parliaments has not really helped in leveraging uh, 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 cause for um, better quality of education for Dalits. So these are the three realities I would like to focus. One is there is an exclusion hiding behind the pretense of inclusion. The caste system's DNA is evident in education system. And the, um, uh, the hard fought political representation has not really made much difference to the quality of education to the Dalits. Next. Now, <clears throat> there is, I think we need to recognize that if you look at the education system in India, you would typically find all features of the caste system in the education system. You find allied private schools giving quality education to a few sections of the community who are capable of uh, paying high fees and you have 
government schools largely populated by the poor and the marginalized sections where the quality of education is very poor so that is typical of a caste system providing for graded inequalities and the government schools have low quality teaching and you find since independence there is a degradation of free public education on one side there is a promise of free education but the free education there is a, a, a significant degradation of the free education next the another facet of caste systems dna in the education system is the teaching staff and the education officers their social attitudes community prejudices they very uh, significantly impact the, the 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 narrative that happens in the classroom the kind of uh, confidence that you are giving to the children the kind of uh, value you are giving to the child all these things are at play in the classrooms then in the textbooks you find there is invisibility stereotyping and avoidance of mention of discrimination and you also find in the lessons across the country the caste bias in the lessons is evident a number of studies have very clearly brought out next there is also there are also instances of violence children put to abuse then discrimination and segregation these are uh, uh, evident across the country in the schools and the colleges and in the uh, university also rohil rohit vemulas incident clearly brought out as how even in the universities there is a, a palpable uh, instance of discrimination that the children are suffering next now coming to the political representation the political representations the 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 dalits have secured through hard uh, uh, battle the studies have shown that it has not really made much difference to secure quality education to dalits for example at a village level you would not find the 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 elected representatives at the village level espousing the cause of education for the dalis in fact during my visits to the villages i found when i sit in the grama sabhas attended by all communities there is hardly any mention on issues concerning dalis education grama sabha after grama sabha i find these issues don't come up but when i go to the sc locality or tribal habitations then i find there are a lot of issues the the, the parents are coming up with uh, uh, issues concerning uh, the education why is this happening that is happening because somewhere at the psyche of the society the access to education is not something that needs to be taken note access to education for dalits is not something that needs to be taken note and spoken about why because that is that is something uh, 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 i would say a feature of the caste system the caste system thrives on keeping certain sections of the people uh, um, away from the education and that's why there is a general psych in the society that when when the society as a whole is together that there is no uh, uh, that kind of a Mm, eagerness to talk about access to education quality education to dalis when you go to the dalis in their habitations you would find that they have a lot of issues to talk about but they don't open their mouths when they are sitting with others similarly that is what is happening in the assemblies in how many assemblies and parliament debates one has found a quality to discussion debate on the dalit education on the inequities that are there on the on the inequities that are widening in the access to education the access to quality education 
and during the last two years also dalis particularly suffered during the covid for two years most of the dalit children could not uh, access education because they don't have access to online education and added to that they, their families have faced uh, uh, hunger starvation the loss of employment loss of livelihoods so a double whammy the dalit children were subjected to but i have not seen any debate in any state assembly or parliament on these issues so the elected representatives particularly the scst um, mlas or mps i would say they have failed to bring out these issues that is where i said that, that uh, they have failed to leverage this political representation for scsts to further the cause of the dalits similarly in the legislative committees there are a number of legislative committees in operation i don't find any legislative committee in any state or at the parliament level particularly looking at these issues closely to bring out what needs to be done for the nation as a whole next please then some of the issues that i would like to highlight very briefly one harvard professor lant prichet has observed that there is no education system in india it is only a selection process where small percentage benefit but vast majority get wasted if you look at g exams neat exam lakhs of people lakhs of students appear for these exams only a few of them get elected based on their rote uh, 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 memory and their ability to answer uh, uh, the questions uh, uh, fast the the students understanding of the concepts are hardly put to test so it is what is happening today is a large number of people are in the school system but there is a uh, there is a, a a kind of a selection process which filters some of them uh, uh, to employable positions and to get into that selection the, the the corporate houses have opened up coaching centers across the country mushrooming mushrooming of these uh, coaching centers uh, for preparing the students they are like factories from morning to night Uh, preparing the students to crack these examinations and it is it is only the rich only those who can afford are able to put their children in these coaching centers so consequently you find only those who have economic power are able to get into these kind of uh, uh, opportunities and get meaningfully employed all others are i would uh, i'm afraid are getting settled down in a very low end service jobs next i think by now the country ought to have recognized that considering the industrial revolution with uh, uh, 4.0 with uh, machine learning artificial learning english is a, a, is is something that definitely gives access to employment for the children uh, but unfortunately the national education policy 2020 discourages importing education to the children and uh, and and uh, and uh, talks of uh, uh, providing uh, uh, english medium education only from fifth class uh, or uh, preferably from eighth class but i would say that from the third class onwards across the country there should be universal access to english medium education for dalit children in fact one state has taken this bold step state of andhra pradesh has taken this bold step they have announced a policy for providing universal access to english medium education for ch- for all the children from the third class onwards otherwise what is happening is those who can afford are going to private schools accessing uh, uh, english medium education dalit children marginalized uh, ch- uh, children from the marginalized sections they are in the public schools and they are not able to have english medium education 
and they are deprived to access uh, 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 employment opportunities in the market. Next. Now coming to the way forward, a few thoughts uh, uh, I thought I'll share with you. There is one very successful model that has worked for many years in the state of Telangana, social welfare residential schools, where large number of residential schools, government have invested in these residential schools, provided uh, uh, very high quality infrastructure, invested on uh, recruiting uh, um, experienced teachers, invested on their uh, training and provide a totally different approach to education for uh, SCST children in these Russian schools. Consequently, most of these children, they performed so well that many of them were able to enter into IITs, IIMs, get into med medical colleges, get, in, get into many other professional schools. They were able to do much better than uh, uh, other students uh, of other communities uh, uh, in the state. This has happened because of the whole approach to education was changed. There was emphasis on preparing the community, emphasis on uh, uh, preparing the teachers, sensitizing the teachers, and investing on building the building the self-confidence of the students. All these elements have come together in the social parents of schools uh, initiative. And consequently, we have thousands of children coming out of these uh, schools very successfully. So when it has worked at one state, it may be possible for the, uh, for, the, for, the, for the nation as a whole to replicate some of these best practices across the country. Then there is a imperative need it is imperative for increasing spending on the education. Right now, only 2% of GDP is going for education. It has to go up. We have to invest more on infrastructure, invest more on teacher training. And as I've said earlier, particularly from the context of Dalis, their ability to have quality education, their ability to have uh, uh, expand, uh, expand their employment opportunities, giving them access to English medium, investing on uh, uh, teachers to provide quality English medium education is something that, that we need to really plan for. Next. And there is a case for moving away, moving away from schooling for all to learning for all. There, is, there are best practices coming from Vietnam and Estonia, where they have focused on learning for all. And in these countries, the, the bottom most 10% in the, in the uh, economic ladder, the children of these communities are able to fare uh, as uh, fare, they're, they're able to do as well as the children, uh, children of the top 10% in the Europe or America. So this has happened because the, these two countries have focused on learning for all. Right now, we are only focusing on schooling for all. We are looking at uh, uh, gross enrollment rates, things like that. But we have to shift on learning for all. And investment on quality pre-primary education, particularly from the perspective of uh, marginalized sections, Investing on quality pre-primary education is something that is going to give them uh, long-term dividends to get them uh, uh, get them quality to transition to the school education. So focusing on uh, pre-primary education is very much in the interest of marginalized sections. And today we don't have um, uh, learning outcomes measurement at all levels. We don't have uh, the measurement of these uh, learning outcomes at all levels, particularly community-wise. So we need to put in place a system where we'll be able to know where we stand so that we can uh, put in some efforts in those areas where we are not doing well. Next. Most of the teachers in the schools they need a lot of sensitization on how to how to uh, really uh, uh, 
deal with the um, issues of uh, the caste caste discrimination marginalization and uh, you know, work in an environment in such a way that the dalit children feel that their dignity is uh, respected and their self worth is uh, valued so a lot of sensitization to the teachers is needed there is a case for promoting partnership with ngos in fact i can uh, 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 recollect uh, uh, many years back as how in the state of andhra pradesh a, a meaningful partnership the government had with the uh, mb foundation has helped the state to uh, achieve near uh, um, um, abolition of uh, child labor in, in the villages so that kind of a partnerships need to be promoted particularly in the present context today when i see in the villages i am reminded of the uh, situation which i have seen in the early 80s 90s where children used to be in the work they used to be out of work same situation has come back again after the covid after two years of gap many children are going back to the work so there is a great deal of uh, effort that is needed to again get them back into school that is where uh, a lot of effort to work closely with the ngos is needed and finally this aspect of skill building post the schooling what is happening is many dalit children they drop out in, in uh, even at the high school level and then end up uh, with a very low paying jobs so instead if we are able to have meaningful skilling uh, post uh, school uh, they will be able to have access to uh, 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 employable skills and uh, get uh, um, employed in a meaningful way so that kind of a focus is needed so what i have done is i have broadly uh, uh, highlighted the basic features of uh, dalit uh, situation the concerns that we have as far as dalit education is concerned and a few suggestions on the way forward and finally i would like to uh, re re reiterate that today what we are facing is a real emergency and particularly for marginalized sections it is uh, something uh, something uh, i would say a, a matter of uh, grave concern that the policy makers have to really look at very closely and come up with uh, the policies and programs so that uh, 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 a generation of these students are, are not really uh, uh, left behind so these are the thoughts uh, i thought i'll share with you thank you very much thank you mr raju for your thoughts uh, i have noted uh, uh, dr john green has raised his hand but we will take we'll start our discussions immediately after a brief presentation on some aspects of the emergency over to you sajita we can't hear you sajita so in increase your volume can you hear me yes we can hear you okay uh, sorry I, i have i've got two things on so i'm going to just can you hear me yes we can but it's echoing because your second device is also on uh, anusha will you get sajita slides on so maybe one on one you can just exit the audio so that you can speak only through the device you are connected to now are you able to hear me yeah we can hear you but not as well as before uh you're mute on the la laptop i think okay. i don't know which one to yeah now it's better now whatever it is is good so please go ahead okay i hope you can hear me can you uh no this one i think if it's a phone it's not as good uh, sajita the other one was better okay so i'm yes, speaking now on the phone yeah this is better so please 
Okay. Yes, it's good to know. Yes, so sorry for using two things. Sorry for the interruption. Um, I, I'm just going to present a few slides to uh, put some of the things in context. I think both Professor Ramadi Jim and the Medusa explained a lot about the specifics. Um, but um, I'll be going over some of those things. Can we just go to the next slide? Yeah, please? audio is not clear, Sajita. Just maybe can you try the laptop only? And not the phone. Uh, maybe put the phone away and just speak on your laptop. Sorry. Okay. Your laptop. Okay. Can you hear? Me? Yeah, it's okay. But put the other device off. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Hang up on this one then. Okay. Um, so I'm going to try and get through this quickly. Sorry about this. You know, when we when we started the education emergency coalition uh, in July, we talked about three interlocking crises. It's really important to see it not just as the school closures. I think Professor Ramanujan mentioned this. We now have some data, of course, about the health crisis, about the livelihood crisis, and about the school closures. Estimated number of deaths is over 4 million, um, uh, over 5 million. Um, and we can we can see that, um, that it's not just the COVID infections, but other illnesses. The case. Uh, we are not able to hear you, Sajita. Sorry, yeah, switching off the video, I think Kasajita has done, but we are not able to hear you now. Yeah, I think this slide is self-explanatory. We'll wait for Sajita to join us back. But this slide is really talking about the fact of the emergency not being restricted only to the education aspect, but the livelihood and the health aspect, which also impact education. Professor Ramanujam also mentioned it in terms of the dry rations and the non-functioning of the midday meals for most of the two years that the schools were closed. And that has had a significant impact in terms of the nutrition uh, or the malnutrition levels of uh, children. Yeah, so uh, can we go to, so this is a very self-explanatory slide and it's of course based on several research studies that have been done across the country. Anusha, can you go ahead? Yeah, so already I think uh, Raju also mentioned that the emergency has hit everybody but not everybody in the same way. Next slide, please. Yeah, hi. Can you hear me yeah. now? Yes, 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 go ahead. Yeah. So I... I will just uh, say here that uh, we show, know from the data we have collected that the lower primary schools in India were shut for over 100 weeks. There were some variations across states, but overall, uh, across uh, for over 100 weeks. Just to put it in context, the global average was weeks up to January 2022. Even in Latin America, with the most number of closures, the average was 37 weeks. So it's an unprecedented situation that we have, you know, uh, 260 million children who have been without schools for about 100 weeks. Um, next slide, please. Um, and we know that even before the pandemic, the literacy levels, even basic literacy levels, were really very low. So this is from the ASER, uh, you know, uh, 2018, uh, the percentage of children in standard three who could not read a word according to their survey of rural children. And we don't have to go into the, you know, details of state ranking and so on. But essentially, you see that there are several states and over 30% of the children could not read a word in standard three. There's some that are 
you know, better, you could say, but because the proportion is less than 20%. Now imagine these children coming into grade five, which is what happened. And I think the kind of situation that Professor Ramanujan was, was saying is, is perfectly understandable, but on a scale that is running into tens of millions. Next slide, please. Oh, I have lost the connection again. Can you hear me? Yes, we, we can, can hear. You. Okay. A bit patchy, but we can. More than, more than during the pandemic, more than 40% of students in government schools had no learning activity. And as Professor, as Mr. Raju said, a lot of these will be the Dalits, the minorities, the um, you know, the people who, uh, the, the tribal communities and so on, the urban poor. More than 40 had absolutely no learning activity, which includes things just like watching television or listening to the brain. Um, that is the situation that has happened for two years. Next slide. And here we get together, the next slide, please. Um, you know, just like which states, just Comparing these two, the reading levels of 2018 and those uh, states that had, you know, no learning activity. If you just kind of correlate this, you do see that the two are related. In fact, those states that had low learning levels in terms of reading um, also have no learning activity. And you see this group at the top, Bihar, Jharkhand, uh, you know. Uh, ARS Arunachal Pradesh and the one circle at the bottom, these are children who had very limited learning before and who had absolutely no learning activity during these two years. Next slide, please. So this slide is from our own survey because there are very few that show the difference between higher uh, socioeconomic status and lower socioeconomic status. In this study in Telangana, we were able to capture that the big differences between those who are just somewhat better off, and as Raju sir said, our system is so stratified. And we're not talking about the very elite sections, but just those who are parents in the organized sector, who have some knowledge of English, and who are not SC, SC, or OBC. The difference here that many more were, uh, were able to follow classes online, they were enrolled in private schools, they were in tuition, and the most important thing is they even think that their situation better during the pandemic. 50% of them had positive comments, only 9% had negative comments, uh, had positive comments among the poorer sections. So we have. Next slide, please. We worked out a set of uh, guidelines on uh, called the future at stake. It was sent to every state government and so on. We outlined eight steps. I won't say there was much of a response from the state governments at least. And uh, could we move to the next slide, please? And skip the next two slides and just go to the to the one on the education finance. If you can. If you can show that on the um, last case. No, um, we need to go to the one on education finance. Could you go back? Yeah, back. Oh, I, I think something has got missed. Yeah, maybe a slide got missed. Yeah. Anyway, I mean, when when you see this, you you, you when, if you see the graph, you will see that government education expenditure as a share of GDP fell in in 2022-23. So this is how we are responding to the crisis that the education uh, expenditure has actually fallen. So finally, I just like to conclude by saying that. So the response has been really the denial of the scale of the education emergency, an elite consensus that school reopening and business as usual is just sufficient. What you need is some minor kind of 
analysis and so on. There's a complete failure of the political parties to take up the education emerging. And the next slide, please. And an inability of the people to articulate a difference to education and a diversion of attention from the education emergency. So I don't mean to end on a pessimistic note, but the main thing I wish to say is that we really have to continue with this effort because there is an effort to almost brush it under the carpet. So thank you very much and sorry for all the interruptions. Thank you, Sujita. Towards the end, your voice was sounding much more normal, but we got the gist of what you were trying to present and the slides were very self-explanatory. So, uh, Anusha, will you bring the background slide again? So, between now and uh, around till 5 o'clock, so around 45 minutes, or uh, sorry, till 4.45, for around half an hour, I'll uh, invite uh, interventions and, you know, submissions from people here. You can use a raise hand button on the bottom right of your phone or your computer so then i'll record your name and i'll call you in the order in which you raise your hands so all of you i hope can see the raise hand on the bottom right and then uh, you can just click on that i'll be able to note it and then i'll just call people in the order that they have raised their hands so at this point in time so we will discuss not only i think uh, the specifics of the challenge that we have in front of us but i think equally importantly or more importantly i'll request the speakers to uh, speak more in terms of what is it that we need to do, what is it that we can do, both in terms of the requirement as well as in terms of the possibilities for action that a group of people like us can engage with over the next uh, few months. And um, uh, when you speak, uh, please introduce yourself briefly. We haven't had a round of introductions, so you can briefly introduce yourself uh, before you start speaking. Yeah. So, Professor John Kurian and then uh, Professor Venita Kaul. Professor John Kurian, go ahead. Professor John, you are on the audio only mode, so I don't know that you clicked on the raise hand by mistake. If you would like to speak, then you need to come on the mic mode. Yeah. So uh, I'll request uh, Venita, can you go ahead? Um, good afternoon to everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, no, I just wanted to respond to uh, the two three presentations, uh, which were really very um, kind of thought provoking, uh, particularly uh, Mr. Raju's on the situation of the Dalits and how this is persisting despite uh, so much of uh, so-called reforms in education and uh, the new policy coming in and a lot of excitement around it. Uh, the situation, I mean, we fear that the, situa they may, the situation may remain where it is despite all this. And so there is really an emergency to do something about it, to be able to really improve the, the um, situation in which most Dalit children and a lot of other underprivileged children are uh, kind of getting a very uh, second class uh, education or I mean, a second class treatment, I would say. Uh, the point I wanted to make was that uh, he rendered uh, English medium education for children from class three onwards. I just want to uh, raise a concern regarding that because I know it is a real uh, social divider in a way because English is uh, seen as a, a language of privilege and uh, those who are able to speak English are uh, have a certain advantage, de definitely social advantage, I would say. Uh, but so we should be able to build in or, uh, or uh, kind of in, uh, envision that equity or equality around those, around the social uh, disadvantage. But uh, bringing in English media for privileged children, my own fear is from what I uh, look at some of the data, some of the research that has happened is that even in the private schools, if you see some surveys have done of children in the, uh, elementary, the, the elementary level, uh, their uh, reading levels, their reading fluency rates are very high but their reading comprehension is not so good. And we see this whole um, uh, trend in our education system of rote learning. Uh, a lot of it is depend is largely stemming from 
a lack of comprehension because children are not coming into the in uh, into the school system with fa from families that are actually uh, well uh, uh, well versed in English and they don't have the familiarity and and uh, they are being this English is being imposed upon them so uh, even if you see in terms of of course the people from the better uh, privileged families they are survivors and they manage to survive the system and have other means of being able to uh, move forward but uh, the children from the underprivileged are more likely to get left behind so the uh, to cut it short what i want to say is that you know what we need to be talking about is bringing in more of communicative english into the uh, for children from all for all children particularly children uh, from the dalit background uh, so that they are able to be at par with others so far as communication is concerned but bringing in english medium i think even for i and i would agree with the national policy that that is not right for the younger child at all because it influences the entire information processing uh, since children are not familiar with the language they struggle with the vocabulary the expression and are not able to really uh, process whatever uh, cognitively whatever is the information coming to them and therefore the foundational skills or foundational um, competencies of children at this stage are actually very low and it is largely they try to make up through rote learning which is in the long run does not work so i would like to make that uh, differentiation that we should be recommending english to be made as a, a, a language to be learned right from beginning maybe from class 1 maybe from preschool also just oral language particularly and then subsequently moving into the written form but not english as a medium of instruction and the second yeah, point i want to Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to ask you if there's anything else other than the English uh, medium thing. Go ahead, please go ahead. One other point I wanted to make was that I'm very happy that he talked about pre-primary education as an equal, as a equalizer or as a significant intervention. I think that uh, pre, I mean, there's research pre-primary education, if given well, good quality preschool education, is actually uh, contributed to not in many cases narrowing, but in certain very uh, small uh, cases, even we have our own data. or a small sample where it has almost uh, removed the gap between the better off and the poorer families uh, so it, it can that is age in which children if they're given the good with given appropriate intervention and quality education can really um, be equal as a fortunate thank you Yeah, yeah thank you vinita uh, purnima next uh, please introduce yourself briefly before you make your point Uh, Purnima is looks like she's disconnected. Uh, request Niranjan to speak next. Hello. Can you hear me now? Yeah, Purnima, we can hear you now. Go ahead, and then Niranjan, and then uh, Baskar Ram. Sorry, sorry. So, like, uh, basically, my question was that when I looked uh, the presentation on all the uh, presentations, the health and the um, uh, you know, like the marginalized health plus literacy. go very much hand in hand and um, and i was wondering like uh, in the policy uh, although like the english medium not only the english medium i'm saying uh, extra care has to be given in balwadi and preschool no and uh, what are we going to do about it is my concern like um, not only just nutrition it is also linked with livelihood because many many women were not able to uh, find uh, when everything closed you no know, the schools and everything there was a lot of break up in the the way people are going for work and all that so like the preschool not being there has been a big problem for the safety and security of children you no know? like when we were looking at the whole presentation i was feeling that so my question is what what has been going to be forward in this areas is my concern yeah uh thank you purnima there is a question for us uh, niranjan next uh and now i would start requesting people just keep your remarks as brief as possible so that everybody can have a chance niranjan please go in next thank you guru thank you for this uh, <clears throat> you know brief intervention for providing me an opportunity i think you know all of us know that the pandemic has created a kind of a devastating you know kind of things all of us know about it but what i could see from my state from karnataka 
the things are really moving from bad to worse. That is simply because of uh, one important reason, that is the hasty decision of implementing a policy that has bypassed both parliament and came and which aims to build you know, uh, an education system based on Indian ethos and traditions is, is really you know, kind of uh, creating larger you know, problems, larger problems, both in terms of uh, socio-political you know, kind of uh, challenges. So I think probably how do we really address along you know, uh, with the COVID uh, you know, situation, how do we really address this larger uh, ideological you know kind of issues which basically aim to distort the very uh, you know understanding of education uh, for instance you know like uh, even another important uh, uh, you know factor that i what i noticed in the uh, you know in this ast uh, uh, implementation uh, you know thing uh, the entire uh, right to education in my opinion it is not just right to education it's right to care protection nutrition and equitable quality education but now more and more uh, it got reduced to just you know foundation literacy and, uh, and numeracy again which is a very important concern for me people like us uh, who have worked almost more than uh, three and a half four decades uh, for you know kind of uh, realizing the right how do we really address that uh, and you know as part of uh, you know kind of uh, way forward what i personally feel we are not really doing much you know to bring back rt as a fundamental right on the track so now rt is completely derailed and nothing is mentioned uh, you know either in the policy statement or you know the programs that what they are discussing about now so this is completely last so a, a fundamental right which is uh, there in the constitution is 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 not at all there in any kind of uh, uh, at the implementation level is a big concern and how the coalition address this is is a, is an important uh, issue and this cannot be seen in isolation. I could see what is happening in education in terms of privatization, what Mr. Raju said, in terms of uh, inequality, segregation, you know, in terms of discrimination. These are all, all these are also, you know, the issues of larger policy, you know, kind of thing. So therefore, our engagement with the NEP, uh, you know, to uh, stop it uh, further damaging the entire system is also equally important. And uh, how do we really plan uh, you know through the coalition is 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 an important issue that we need to think of as a way forward third thing what i have seen again from my experiences particularly whether it is the revision of textbooks or you know kind of uh, designing a well thought uh, you know a program to address uh, the learning deprivation or you know the learning you know kind of challenges by the pandemic and also various other issues the academic bodies like uh, uh, SCRTs in 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 our case DSCRT and diets have to play a very important uh, role but what i could see these bodies are, you know, kind of more, you know, outsourcing their responsibilities to the private players and, you know, many a times to the NGOs. I'm nothing against NGOs, but NGOs can only supplement the, you know, kind of uh, uh, the, you know, process of these bodies. But uh, it's, it's, it's happening the other way around. So therefore, how do we really strengthen these academic bodies to intervene uh, in a, in a, in a uh, kind of uh, whatever they are assigned for? Take, for example, Article, sorry, Section 29 of the Right to Education Act is very clear. What should be the procedure for prescribing the curriculum? What should be the methodology? All these things. But uh, nevertheless, if you look at the way that uh, the Karnataka you know, state is uh, changing you know, or revising the textbook is really alarming and uh, you know it creates a lot of uh, uh, fear you uh, know among us uh, like where are we really heading towards so therefore i think how do we really make these bodies responsible for what they are meant for is an important issue that you know correlation uh, should you know think of and i personally feel now uh, education cannot be addressed only through education activists and the people who are working in the field because this is a larger challenge i think uh, 
what best we can do to bring uh, other uh, sectors, uh, you know, say people from Dalit sector, students, youth, women, farmers, you know, together uh, to build a, a kind of a larger coalition of civil society to build a strong social movement for action. Because, uh, of course, we have been doing seminars, we are doing webinars and all that is fine. That is only at one level as part of understanding the problem you know better and you know to plan what can be the strategies but unless we do action programs unless we get into the field you know to say no to a couple of uh, things i i don't think that we really you know move forward so therefore uh, what is that you know kind of uh, we can do to uh, do this is one thing and of course i agree with uh, venita certainly we need to teach english uh, at a competency level as a language but not uh, not as a medium of uh, education that has been the demand for a long time even uh, section 29f of the rt act at least provides for you know up to class 8 the medium of education should be as far as possible in the uh, mother tongue so i agree with her of course we need a larger discussion because there are various uh, different uh, you know kind of uh, viewpoints on that uh, we have to respect viewpoints but uh, it needs a kind of uh, healthy discussion uh, basically because it is an established truth across the globe that uh, uh, you know if a medium of education is in mother tongue so that the children can uh, you know really engage in the entire process more creatively and more you know kind of uh, in a in an in in original way to contribute to the entire uh, construction of knowledge you know uh, in the process. So therefore, I think uh, we need to address uh, I, 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 as a, a correlation. I think now uh, we have a greater role to play, uh, particularly in the context of uh, Karnataka. I, I don't think that we can adopt one single strategy as a kind of strat strategy at the national level. Each state has its own, you know, kind of uh, issues when it comes to Karnataka. It is the uh, revision of textbooks or, you know, preventing girl children attending, you know, schools and colleges. Now it has been extended to universities also. I think those issues need to be addressed and uh, correlation as, you know, uh, as a guiding, you know, kind of thing. I think we need to address all these issues. This is to uh, just share if, if necessary, I can come back. Thank, Thank you, you Niranjan, so much. Thank you for all your valuable points. And uh, uh, Professor John Kurian had already raised his hand earlier, but he is able to speak. So John Kurian and then Bhaskar. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Please go. Perfect. 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 All right. Let me quickly let me quickly uh, uh, address four 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 issues very briefly. One is. You are on two devices, so the device you are not speaking on, just put it off because it's echoing, you know, or you can exit the audio in the other device. Uh, you can speak in the device you are connected with your mic on, then it will be fine. What do I put off, please? Uh, you are on two devices, but your mic is on on one device. So you, just that if you keep next to you and the other device, you can uh, exit the audio so that it will not echo. Since you're on two devices, it's echoing. No, I have no, I have no two devices. I only have one. Only okay, have fine. One. No problem. Please go ahead. You, um, maybe you have it on two tabs. You can just close the other tab. You can keep the no, one. I have done. Current. Anush, I have, I have removed the okay. second user. No problem. Professor John, you can go ahead. Oh, yeah, maybe he had joined in two tabs. That's right. He's coming in again. So in the meantime, Bhaskar, will you go ahead? And then Professor John can come in again. Bhaskar, please go ahead. Ah, OK. Yeah, so I just wanted to share uh, my perspective on this. Of course, Indian education system was already quite bad shape. Uh, maybe it was in the general ward. And uh, this whole lockdown thing has, uh, it's like, Bundas have entered the general ward and uh, beat up the education system to into ICU now. Uh, I, I one thing is, I think we should stop uh, telling because of the pandemic uh, for a couple of reasons. One is, pandemic death is supposed to be a leveler, uh, whereas what we have seen throughout is the you know as this title slide itself says deepening inequities 
across the board all sorts of inequalities uh, in terms of um, uh, money in terms of education everything has become completely lopsided so i don't think the rise in inequality can be due to uh, pandemic or death second is generally adversity should bring out you know um, some sort of social cohesion man is a social animal there are of course some bad people but mostly people should be uh, socially aware helping each other but what has happened in the last two years is complete uh, you know it has brought out the worst in people in terms of complete selfishness and i think this is this is not because of the pandemic it's because of excessive fear propaganda which has been relentless in the media continuing even today so this um, increasing inequality is uh, is is purely because of the 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 uh, lockdown and school closure response as also the uh, uh, slides by uh, sajita have shown i mean is, india's sort of is is the gold medal in terms of uh, the uh, um, uh, school closure it's it's just ridiculous the level of uh, school closure which has happened so anyway given all this my thoughts question is what do we do now what does nce do now um, in terms of uh, what can we do concretely to help the situation raise awareness uh, appropriate interventions and so on um of course one thing is uh, uh, of course these these meetings are useful i'm wondering uh, whether a physical meeting one or two day intense event where uh, people who are here at least a subset can come and participate and we can sort of brainstorm on what can be done in the near term and long term to address the situation whether uh, this kind of meeting is already in the plan i don't know um uh, so that those are my thoughts thank you baskar uh, professor korean you can go ahead now you can unmute and speak please go ahead and then professor pravin sin kala yeah professor john korean go ahead i need you to unmute uh, if you unmute then we can hear you you are on mute uh, so just on your device you can click on the mic so that we can you can unmute yourself and then we'll hear you Right. yes please go ahead please go ahead we can hear you perfect okay i think there were just quickly four, four uh, i'm just addressing myself to the four speakers somebody talked about the private schools and the government schools and i think that we must be very careful because the largest number of private schools are these low cost private budget schools which have come up in the last two decades and they are far larger in number than elite private schools so when we talk about private schools we must make this important distinction because a lot of poor ambitious poor and lower middle class attend these pri- low cost private schools whose whose levels of learning are not much higher than government schools i agree with this issue of english is a very important issue the question of whether it should be english medium i, I understand the arguments for english medium schooling which have been raised by dalit dalit intellectuals etc but i think we ought to be very clear on this the work showing shows that english medium education for your poor ha- has not been very successful and and so whatever one says it will still be going on so we'll have to improve those those english medium schools for the poor and lower middle class which are in government and private but we need to focus especially on the teaching of english in regional medium schools not only in schools but in the community which brings me to the third point see the question you know it raises goes back to pre pandemic days because the as sajita's work shows the levels of learning were extremely low anyway before pre pandemic and it has only had deteriorated as a result of the pandemic but we should never forget they were very low before i mean they were horribly low before now to say that schools will should improve i mean of course they should improve to say that they have the main responsibility for learning i agree with that but they, these are children who are going to suffer as a result of the, the inequalities and the low quality of schooling so in in community the community needs to intervene in a very big structured large scale manner to improve the quality of learn of our children's learning which means 
support classes. These used to be run before the pandemic, but they need to be run in a very big organized fashion afterwards, because that's one very concrete thing that can be done. It needed to be done before the pandemic, and now the pandemic has simply accentuated the need to run these classes after, afterwards in a large scale structured fashion. And we need to be able to provide some, some kind of training for the instructors who go in and I was very glad to see that Tamil Nadu has a very large number of volunteers, but I, I, I am going beyond this volunteer business and getting it to a far more organized fashion at the community level. And finally, uh, I, I think what Niranjan was talking about, the need for a large coalition. I, I have some thoughts on this, but there's no, there's, no there is no time for this right now. But I think that uh, why, if there was an opportunity at any other stage to discuss this issue, of a large coalition between the between the disadvantaged groups in India to affect two things: policy at the at the national, state, and district level, and to and to uh, and to affect community level interventions for all three groups. I think you need to do both at policy level and you need to focus at the at the, level, the third level because for all three groups. The basic problem is a lack of social and cultural capital, and we need to have institutionalized means to be able to, to affect both policy and interventions at the community level. Thank you. Yeah, Professor Kurian, thank you very much for that. If you see on the slide, the desirable outcomes on the right side, we are really talking about grassroots organizations, uh, you know, uh, having to become a part of what we are trying to do. Professor Praveen Sinclair, next. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everybody. This is Parveen Sinclair. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? I can hear yes, you. we can hear you. Please go ahead. All right. Uh, there were two or three points I wanted to make. One was that any action that is agreed on should I believe needs to be done on a pilot basis to be able to be seen to be doing something positive. And then uh, society would probably uh, accept it more easily because acceptance by, you see, when we say that we should have large social movements and so on and so forth, that won't happen unless it. Uh, any movement is seen to be useful and doable. So if it's done on a small scale, smaller scale than a national scale, it may work. The second thing is we need to remember that any changes being made, we may not agree with those changes, but any changes being made are being driven by a certain ideology. So that has to be kept in mind also when uh, one is taking action. The third thing, which is actually was my original point when I first raised my hand, was that children with disabilities are always ignored in any movement. And that should not happen. It happened even with the RTE where they needed to bring in an amendment for children with disabilities again. I, that is really sad. So, but how does one deal with it? That because this requires special sensitization and uh, concern. And of course, enough people who can deal with it. We don't have enough, you know, even the so called traditional, whatever teachers traditionally. Uh, trained teachers. We don't have enough of them to. So how do we maybe enhance their abilities like an ASHA movement, ASHA level kind of training at least um, at the grassroots level to make parents aware of the possibilities, children aware of the possibilities for the different movements, including the uh, you know children who are considered uh, mentally challenged. There's a lot of potential there. They cannot be left behind. Or at least they should, they need to reach, they need to be helped to reach that potential. So 
some kind of grouping of schools with some people who work in these areas rather than just one is to one. But ashas and uh, teachers generally being sensitized towards this. These were some of the points I thought I would just bring forth. Thank you. Thank you so much. Shanta Sinaji, next. Hello. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, I, I would uh, uh, agree with most of what uh, my colleagues have so far stated. Uh, first of all, I should thank Ramanujam for his uh, brisk uh, critique uh, and presentation. From him, I would like to know two things. Uh, one is he talked about the lessons that has to be learned about COVID and incorporated into the school uh, experience between the child and the teacher. I just wanted to know if there were concrete examples of it from which we can learn because we have attempted this, but it was more an NGO kind of an activity. But if we can elaborate on it, that would be good. The second thing, again, is about digital learning that he has talked about. Uh, I should think that uh, the, the fact that he raised about how Baijus have become more important and how the teachers are responding to it, I think somewhere the teachers union should raise a voice against it because it is so disempowering to teachers and also put it in the context of colonization of knowledge. Somewhere teachers are organic knowledge creators. They have been able to transact and learn from children, learn from society, give it back to them and a bit of a theorizing on teachers as knowledge persons will have to come and we critique the digital learning, of course, not just in terms of inequity, but also in terms of how there is total abandonment of creation of knowledge by teachers, by SCERT, by diets, all of them become redundant and maybe it will disempower the entire society. So we may have to work hard on theorizing the impact institutional and structural impact of digitization along with uh, the inequalities that we have talked about. And about Raju uh, K. Rajus, I think uh, it's always so inspiring and moving to listen to him. The emphasis on education apartheid, the education on discrimination, the emphasis on exclusion and the total dip hypocrisy of the education system. Here I agree with Bhaskar also and also what John Kurian said, this is not something new and this has happened even before COVID but exasperated, uh, exacerbated uh, due to COVID. How do we convert this education emergency that now uh, uh, faces us into an advantage? And I think again here we will have to go back to uh, the Tamil Nadu's uh, volunteer program. We have all tried uh, this. But the scale at which it is being done, perhaps there is a lot to learn from there on the nitty gritties of the program and the need for support classes as John Kurian has uh, just told us. Finally, I think all this will have to be again put in the framework of what Niranjan has talked about, the Right to Education Act. It was a hard won fundamental right. All of us here have fought for it, you know, and then we cannot allow it to be ignored. It is a fundamental right. How do we fit everything into each one of the articles of the right to uh, the edu education? So these are uh, some of the issues I would like to talk about. And the issue of English language needs a full discussion. It's so difficult to talk about it at the moment uh, here in this forum. Finally, I think when it comes to private schools and the discussion, I would just like to mention that it is an indication that poor parents want education, poor parents are demanding quality education and they're spending at least 50% or even more of their income on education and they think whether right or wrong that investing in those local shops called private education which John has so well put is a route to a quality education. So let us just recognize the enormous demand that there is for uh, among the poor for education and the growing private schools is in fact an indication of the growing demand. Thank you. 
thank you, Shantaji. Shubhraji next, and then after that, Anand ji. Shubhraji, go ahead. Again, we're running out of time. Request everybody to keep their remarks as brief as possible. Thank you. Shubhraji, are you there? Um, I think she's not there on the call right now. So, Ananji, will you go, go ahead? Anand, Anand Madhavi, you mean? Yes, yes. Bulia, Bulia. Yes, yes. We can hear you. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Guru Murthy Ji. Uh, pranam and good evening to one and all. Just wanted to mention a few bare facts about the Bihar education as mainly the basic education is in a very dire state of Bihar. When I, I was listening to you all, I, I have taken uh, aback the condition in the southern state and the condition in Bihar. So there is a huge gap between the two. You can say this is an ocean and a very small sea. This is the basic difference. Uh, like I can just cite a couple of examples which has appeared and it's also in the uh, report of the UDAS. The student of class 10, 76% does not know ABCD in there. Last time when we were discussing with Sajitha, if she remembers correctly, Father Joe, who is working with the Dalit community in Bihar, he has mentioned that we are preparing them to be the domestic help. Uh, all the students, we all are working for that. The dropout rates in Bihar is very high. And you will be surprised to know in class 9th, there is a dropout of 9, 2.5 lakhs of girls students every year. Only 58.63% libraries are there. In uh, At the same time, there are so many other things. So there are approximately 7 lakhs teachers in the um, sanction post of the teachers in Bihar, out of that, three lakhs fifteen thousand, almost every first, every almost fifty percent, the uh, the seats are vacant, still vacant. So there are two things which are very important. First is the quality, and second is the quantity. Mainly, if you talk about the basic education, Bihar it is in the worst condition. Schools are government is also closing the schools in the name of Barzer. Why they, they have opened the college schools two or three years before when there was no scope, there is no building, there is no field for them, there is no library for them. Then why they have done it as a student from the Dalit uh, community and the not poor family, they have to travel four or five kilometers to attend another schools. So in class eight, during this COVID, in class eight, 80% students of the class eight in Bihar of the government school day does not have the digital uh, mobile or any other equipment so that they can connect with the off online classes. And situation in class uh, 10th is also not so good. It's approximately 45%. Anji, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. I'm sorry, I'm not interrupting anybody. But maybe, uh, you know, you're talking about the situation in Bihar. We do understand this Bihar will be much worse than the rest of the country. But in the interest of time, could you talk about the Kalam Satyagraha? Because that will give ideas to everybody. So, you Kalam Satyagraha a little bit about to Sarki uh, beneficial hoga. City ke bare mein baat karne ke bare. Thank you. Sorry. So keeping the mind in all this situation, we came and created a platform. Lot of many other organizations like Right to Education, Right to Food, Dalit uh, Adhikar uh, Morcha, uh, this uh, Sakhi and Nari Gunjan, they all have come together and we have created a, a platform called Kalam Satyagar. This will, uh, this is a process, and this is you can say a campaign which can try to put education on the forefront. And reaction is very good. First day we have organized a, a meeting with various uh, groups of people uh, in Bihar on 6th of May. From 7th May onwards, there are 13 tweets from the Chief Minister of Bihar regarding the, how he is trying to improve the education situation in Bihar. This is uh, this campaign is will uh, is a statewide campaign, and we will be interacting not just with the people. We will be also interacting with the education missionary. We will also put pressure on the government to regularize the thing. We will also see if the seasons of the 
the various colleges and universities may uh, can be regularized and it is being supported by each and every part of the uh, people across the across the globe i am getting support from them uh, they, they they are coming forward and they are saying this kind of intervention is required for bihar because uh, education is the main thing if, if uh, so which can make life to, in the life of the people so this system is in uh, you can see there are n number of things in bihar uh, so far as education is concerned if we cannot correct it there is no no meaning of development because it it leads to anarchy it leads to unemployment it leads to crime as well and students and the young people of bihar what they are doing right at the moment they are just not concentrating on the constructive work so this program kalam satyagraha is a positive program is a uh, which will force the government to change amend uh, his its ways and do something good for the teachers students schools and colleges because in and, and before we uh, understand all these things uh, it is also important to not just sensitize them it's also important to make them involved take them on board there are three things which are very important to do any program that is we call it uh, you have to take the man samne wale ka pehle man lena hai फिर उसका तन लेना है और तब निश्चित रूप से किसी भी को सफल करने के लिए हमको धन की आवश्यकता पड़ती है तब फिर हमको पैसे की जरूरत पड़ती है दिस कैंपेन रिक्वायर्स ऑल थ्री थिंग्स अगेन ऑन फोर्थ ऑफ नेक्स्ट मंथ वी आर ऑर्गेनाइजिंग युवा संवाद विल बी गोइंग टू ऑल द यूनिवर्सिटीज विल बी गोइंग टू ऑल द डिविजन देर आर नाइन डिविजन इन बिहार एंड आफ्टर दैट विल बी क्रिएटिंग अ ग्रुप इवन एट द ब्लॉक लेवल देन वी विल गो विद शिक्षा संवाद यात्रा Uh, to each and every districts public discourses will take place press conferences will take place discussion with the uh, influences of that particular districts will take place followed by the gramin chopal gramin chopal will not just happened at one place we will go and we will do gramin chopal at one place but the organizations which will create at the district level that will take it uh, take further to even at the panchayat level you have to sensitize it and what is more important that we have to make stronger the school management committee if the school management com- committee is strong where the lo- local people are the part of it then gradually it will improve so it requires it, it it has to be first sustainable it requires all kind of forces to get this uh, uh, done because issues are numerous we have to take note of the basics and if basic education improves everything will improves even the higher education will improve the teacher orientation program is not taking place we are just trying and trying to weave the things which needs to make this campaign as a success thank you any question about this kalam satyagraha i am there for that thank you uh, anand ji one request i'll have of you and i'll have of uh, professor ramanujam also is where you described programs that are already in operation it will be very useful for us to have a kind of a brief note which we can share with everybody we have listened to all the speakers and many of your suggested actual programs that are happening but aapka jo kalam satyagraha ke bare mein aap jo bol rahe hain uska ek note aap hame bana ke denge to hum usko bhi circulate karenge taki bihar mein jo ho raha hai baaki jagahon mein bhi hum koshish kare ki usi tarah ke ka program hum kare thank you uh, next boliye i have already shared it to uh, sajitha the concept yes thank you yes. thank you thank you to concept note bhi hai aur as you detail the uh, concept note into more specific programs aur uski jo progress ho rahi hai uske bare mein bhi aap update karte rahiyega uh, sayantri next thank you very much thank you very much yeah uh, hello can everybody hear me yes please go ahead yeah uh so i very very interesting discussion and many of the things as an implementing agency in delhi tripura and chatisgarh we are faced with many of these uh, you know uh, problems challenges rather i would say in implementing our early childhood as well as foundational programs for the government schools uh two things that uh, somebody brought out is the Uh, the quality of the scrts which really were the content developers for education for the public school system 
uh, as well as working as the connect to the teacher training based on the curriculums and textbooks, et cetera, that they design. Uh, we feel that uh, these organizations need huge reform. I mean, alongside of just bringing the classrooms alive, the SCRTs themselves need a huge system rejig. And uh, they are filled with a lot of committed and probably competent people. But the system is become very moribund. There is no room for new thought. There is no room for uh, opening up of discussions. Uh, there is a and NGOs, I feel, can play a role uh, to catalyze the environment. Uh, but for that, the departments of education are not somehow seeming to have any idea of how to make the systemic shift. How will this partnership work? Uh, somewhere I feel uh, taking an NGO, even with Ahwan's work, uh, while MOUs, et cetera, are being signed with various state governments, but deep down within the system, the NGO is not seen as a true partner to the reform. Uh, the NGO is expected to just be working on its own agenda, uh, which uh, does not go anywhere. And it will not be sustainable if it is not wedded in uh, with the vision of a transformative impact on the SCRTs, diets, etc. Uh, so uh, this was one point that uh, I think um, it was brought out by Niranjan uh, in the in the in the discussion and i thought that i would like to talk about it because we are having lots of uh, discussions with scrts across these states we work very closely with them uh, but there is a lot of uh, push and pull on that so i will just keep it brief that was one point i wanted to make thank you thank you so much uh, jill next sorry you've been waiting for a long time but we're just going in the order that people raise hands jill please go ahead yeah uh, can people hear me okay I'm just yes. trying to, yeah, I'll just turn on. Um, okay. All righty. Um, it doesn't seem like the camera's on. All right. So what I wanted to say um, was in terms of dealing with these educational inequities, which um, clearly we've seen in the pandemic with the digi digital divide and so on, I think what is not added often, not uh, stressed often, is the kind of social malaise that has happened among children. So apart from uh, the schooling itself, um, you know, we've seen in many, many rural areas how the increase of drug, alcohol use, um, certain kinds of... Uh, aggressive behavior has increased. And in order to contextualize this, I wanted to say that recently in response uh, to a lot of the violence that has come up in the state of Kerala, in terms of communal violence, in particular political violence, um, we, a number of us got together to look at how um, both, uh, uh, how we could change that uh, within the schooling. Now, of course, Kerala is not, is probably has the greatest equity uh, in terms of 95% literacy and in terms of uh, uh, numbers of people co completing secondary school. Um, but what that doesn't correlate with the increasing violence in the society. And so I think that is also something that needs to be taken into consideration in this education emergency. Uh, what we have tried to do with the Kerala government is uh, we brought together recently, for example, both people who could talk about what that looked like in their communities, what student behavior looked like in their communities and what we might offer uh, the Kerala government is there soliciting um, curriculum changes uh, at the moment. Uh, and what we heard from parents, for instance, is as a result of the pandemic, their children are never off their headsets. 
uh, they don't listen, there's a discipline problem, they can't control their children. Many, many such comments we heard uh, in a public hearing. And so what we began to realize is that this notion of bringing uh, into education a greater sense of belonging, a greater sense of community, uh, and really what we're starting to talk about in primary, secondary, and post-secondary is peace education, social harmony, um, reconciling conflict. Uh, and we see this is absolutely necessary in preempting greater inequity from coming to a state which has achieved such high equity. So I just wanted to raise this as, an, as a, a kind of an out of the box uh, point where we tend to only think of inequities from one direction. But here is a state that has achieved so much equity in education and we are now really trying to deal with a lot of social violence in terms of peace education. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your suggestions and contribution. Shubankar, next. I can, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. OK, so uh, what uh, Professor Ramanujan and Dr. Sajita Bashir had pointed out the depths of the inequities. It is also very evident that, uh, you know, the policies that the government, whether it is fund allocation or whether many of those things, it, it is very clear that uh, the government is, I can say very loose words, like they are absent in most of the cases. They abdicated their responsibilities. You know? So a coalition like this, uh, I feel that it is very important for us to raise this in various ways. Like in Karnataka, Niranjan has mentioned that the communal polarization in the classrooms, in the schools, the narratives are awful that are coming uh, from various places. So what shall we do? It's, it's a part of the emergency of this. At the same time, the assault in textbooks in various ways, uh, this is also another thing that is there. So I'm sure that in across different states, we would have various different kinds of uh, issues emerging. But overall, it is contributing. It's, it's a larger uh, design as part of that, it's, uh, it's operating. And it is happening in two ways. One is that it is dividing both among the relation between what we are calling as community involvement to schools and all. Uh, it, is, it is a divider in a at the community level in one hand. On the other hand, what is also happening is that the government is, it is very evident that uh, they're not bothered about whether the kids are coming to school, what they are learning and all. There are certain indices they are asking. Uh, as many of you would have seen, you would have known it much better than uh, I know. It's that uh, the, uh, the administrative loads on teachers are not decreasing. Uh, they, it is increasing. In fact, um, that brings to my last point that I have is that, you know, Karnataka has this uh, learning recovery, a formal program. Now, one can look at it is in a little bit, uh, I, I would say it's a very progressive thing that happened in some sense, because the circular went to all schools everywhere in government schools. They said that you don't have to essentially follow the textbook this year and all, which NCF 2005 have been calling that learning also happened beyond textbook. But DSCRT has developed uh, a module called Kalika Chetriki, learning recovery and all. What is actual problem happening now is that there is DSCRT has not, and that brings very important to uh, what Niranjan was pointing out again, that uh, DSCRT has not given enough time to teacher. They didn't train the teachers. So after two weeks now, it started in June 16th when the schools opened. Now we are getting reports from, I work with Bharat Gyan Vigyan Samiti and All India People Science Network. What we are getting report from our colleagues in various districts is that uh, the good teachers who are actively working on various activity-based learning methods, they are coming up with various ways of doing things. But uh, many teachers are feeling completely lost, naturally, you know. So that is something uh, is a part of this, our understanding. So on one hand, what I want to point, on one hand, we have a scenario where 
uh, we can, we are in the curriculum or in the um, classroom, we are saying that which is part of the also uh, uh, National Co Coalition on, of Education Emergency, where we are saying that, you know, you bring back children to school, don't like push them for examination, just allow the that time, what Jam was pointing out, but uh, what Sajita was pointing out and all. But when it is happening in the ground, what is happening is that because the department is completely clueless about these things. And I, I can say with certain degree of confidence because I had seen, uh, we had seen that what happened in last two years in Karnataka. And therefore, Niranjan's point that DACRT has to be strengthened uh, and strengthened, uh, I mean, not just saying that it's strengthened, it should have a roadmap of how do we work with DSCRT uh, rather than DSCRT outsourcing it. So, you know, they have it. So, I mean, this has to be uh, looked at um, carefully. Thank you. Thanks, Shubankar. Uh, Ahmed has been waiting for a long time. Ahmed, please go ahead. Hello. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. OK. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. I want to invite your attention about coastal area communities. Uh, me, Ahmed Sajid. I am working at Edges for the Madras Project Coordinator. It's a community and educational project that concentrates overall development of the students who belong to coastal area community from the locality of Madhra situated to and from district Kerala through quality education and value-based guidance. As usual, the coastal community in this area, economically and educationally backward, the social familial condition and also the lack of government attention in the area is the effect of this kind of backwardness. In this area, I mean the coastal communities of Kerala face many issues, but educational backwardness is the important problem. Before start the project, we did a baseline survey on high school students community and the result of the survey was many students didn't attend the schools. As well as public educational institution couldn't, couldn't act properly, the institution didn't care this kind of students and the students don't have awareness about education. The starting time was very difficult to give awareness about education and it's important, but presently 200 and more students beneficiaries of the project and they're doing different courses. My point is the public education sector is failure to address this kind of students' communities and as well as also the pandemic period was say, the students' community face a different problems like lack of gadgets, internet availability, network issues, and also they didn't use gadgets properly. Many boys students started to do different jobs and make money. Education backwardness community already came to totally. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, uh, Geeta next, Professor Geeta Nambisan. Yeah, you're on unmute, but we are unable to hear you. Can you increase your input volume? Geeta, we are unable to hear you. Maybe your input volume has to be increased. Uh, Geeta's typing. So maybe we'll uh, have Binoy next and then we can go back to her. Binoy, will you go in next? And after Binoy, we have Kishore and Mark. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I work with the Center for Migration and Inclusive Development, an organization working with the uh, migrant workers in the country, and I had the organization executive director. Uh, I was listening to the conversation on the Dalit issue, and uh, uh, I, I mean, there is there is a consensus that migrants was in, uh, was a group which has been left behind, and then the pandemic exposed the plight they were facing. And most of these people are of either from Adivasi, Dalit, or religious minority communities. And uh, over 80% of those who have come as internal migrants to any place, they they prefer not to do so if they get a, a monthly average income of 10,000 or so regularly at their native places, which is a distant uh, drain for rural India as of now. Uh, 
Now, I would like to uh, to to highlight that one, there is a total invisibility of uh, the migrant population after the second wave and, and so forth. And and uh, even in this discussion, I haven't heard much about uh, the migrant workers. So there is uh, in the main even uh, when when we have the school opening, then the mainstream schools also there has been a substantial reduction in the in the, in the learning abilities of children from mainstream communities. And uh, then we can imagine uh, the plight of uh, people, particularly children of migrant workers, um, who, uh, especially in the case of interstate migrant workers, where uh, originally also there has been no uh, opportunity for learning in their mother tongues. Um, now, um, my 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 worry is, it is it is education which is which is the only means to get these people from the vicious circle of poverty and migration and uh, and uh, and this this after this uh, you know pandemic it is there is a substantial you know uh, impact on the potential of this these children getting back to schools after the first uh, after the lockdown those people who went back to their native places a lot of them have uh, you know, uh, have kept their families at the native places when they return to uh, the work destinations. So, um, what will happen to the uh, the education of these children? And then, if people have come back, and uh, if they've gone to a different place, how are they uh, their continuation in education uh, being tracked? And uh, particularly in the case of children who uh, you know get should be enrolled for the first time in school. Or those who move from say fourth or fifth to the uh, the next grade, or to eight to the next grade, or from ten matric, uh, ten to higher secondary also. So I, what I see is that I I've, I've been one of I mean in in discussion with a lot of organizations working on migrants, there has been hardly any serious research on the on the issue, and uh, there is very minimal funding on uh, this issue for. Um, uh, to be, I mean, to do anything, I, maybe this uh, may research or intervention or even a case study. And uh, we see a lot of children out of school. Recently, we put 65 children who were out of school. Back, I mean, at least in a, in a learning in a, in a resource center set up by in the four children who are out of school. So, so there is a lack of sensitivity uh, on the issue. So among the civil society organizations, there is lack of funding, lack of interventions, and uh, it is uh, since these communities or, or these people are quite dispersed, there is there is a, there is a total invisibility to, to the problem and to the people. So, I am happy to work with the team to uh, to have discussions with organizations in India working on migration, internal migration, particularly to see what could be done. I mean, this would require a source destination combinations where we also work with, uh, you know, organizations in source areas and we work with uh, organizations in the in the destinations area. So we can have further conversations. And I just want to flag that it is the most marginalized who migrate um, in the case of internal migration and uh, their children. It is only it is only education which is which can get these people out of this vicious cycle. And we should be doing something. Yeah, thank you, Binoy. Uh, Geeta is back. Geeta, please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, clearly. Can you hear? Okay, chalo, good. Uh, well, I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, I think all the presentation, the first three pre uh, presentations and, you know, all the kinds of responses, uh, I agree. And uh, since there's no time, I'll just very briefly uh, mention a three points. One. I think today there's a there's a lot of emphasis on the whole question of learning now that the surveys have come. And um, so I think we have to uh, think a little deeply about this because this is an international discourse on learning loss and which is actually being uh, plugged as a loss which can be addressed by technology, digitization, etc. And so I think it's important to place it to understand the discourses see that we have a separate, uh, different way of looking at it by placing it in perspective, both in terms of what learning was prior to COVID 
uh, what has happened as a result of uh, COVID, uh, the whole context in which of larger losses of livelihoods, health, etc., the you know decline, the what has happened to the school system, and hence the kind of uh, the fact that children have suffered, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, so that it is looked at far more complex rather than something that by Jews and company can come in and do it. And here I agree with the emphasis on teachers. Uh, the, we need to know um, how teachers can cope because there are diverse marginalities, uh, definitely caste, et cetera, uh, as Mr. Raju has said, but also other groups, you know, marginal groups, the, you know, the migrants like uh, the person just now it was mentioned. So this is a much more complex issue which uh, technology is unlikely in a more standardized way. Unlike, so I think that has to be given because we know that there are large scale reforms. Uh, you know, you have the ADB coming in, you have uh, school improve. I mean, all that is going on, you know, as we speak. So I think we have to be careful about that. The second is to go back to critically looking at the publicly funded school space. Now, I agree that there is, and we need to critique and be aware that yes, uh, where you know the Dalits were concerned, Adivasis, minorities, uh, disabled, uh, this space was not inclusive. There was a lot of exclusion. But if you simultaneously look at the private sector for these communities, it hasn't worked at all. In fact, I think COVID. One thing COVID has shown is that the low cost, uh, the low budget private schools have actually failed. I think that is something that we can highlight, and uh, it is not going to work. And uh, Mr. Raju told us about the Telangana residential schools. There is not one example of a private school which has, which is like the Telangana uh, residential schools, or even like the Navodhya. So I think we need to go back, critique that government school space. Um, be aware that it is being increasingly privatized. All the Baiju and company will enter the uh, government schools like all the other. So we have to be uh, mindful of that, but mindful that that space, why is it, why it is important, that only that space can address marginalities, but we have to critique what is going on, including growing communalization. As far as initiatives, I agree that we need to look at initiatives. They cannot be vague and fuzzy, though you can have community level, uh, larger trying to change mindsets, etc., address, uh, 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 addressing communalization, etc. But within the rights framework, how are children to be supported? I think that has to come in uh, very clearly uh, because that is a serious problem. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Geeta. Uh, Kishore had raised his hand, yeah. but I think he's not on the call now. So, Maya Menon next. Hi, uh, thanks. Um, I think a lot has been said uh, by everybody, and I don't want to repeat. Um, but um, I think all of what all the challenges, all the concerns that uh, everybody has shared, I think hinges on the fact that teachers need to be prepared. Teachers need to be prepared for a different world post-pandemic. And I don't think uh, any government is actually preparing teachers for that. We need to be looking at preparing teachers, supporting teachers, both new teachers coming into the system as well as the existing teachers uh, who are now going back to schools and teaching children in person. Um, whether it is connected with a medium of instruction, whether it is connected with bridging learning gaps and or learning loss, uh, in including children from, uh, uh, you know, from dis uh, backgrounds which are marginalized or, uh, you know, children with disabilities, as well as sensitizing them to the social crisis. For instance, I'm in Karnataka and uh, in Karnataka, uh, we, we've uh, seen terrible case of very, very political uh, uh, politicization of schools and colleges thanks to the hijab crisis. And I don't think teachers are actually taking a stand on that. Recently, I was talking to a, a group of teachers and I was asking, what is your opinion about this? So initially, they, they didn't have a, any issue. Then they said, oh, it was just a distraction. Then uh, some of them said, oh, but actually, in, in the, uh, India is a Hindu nation. And um, an, a, a, another teacher said, oh, but um, is that really an issue? Uh, should, shouldn't we stay away from politics? I said, the politics has come into the classroom. What are you going to do about it? If you had the power, 
what will you do about it? So I think it's about power, empowering teachers to take have a stance. And I, I don't think these are conversations that the government will even drive. Um, and therefore, I mean, I, I agree, Niranjan Aradhya said that DSCRT, SCRT have to actually drive uh, all the, uh, you know, uh, teacher preparation, teacher development programs, content development, etc. But the point is that these are not questions that are going to be driven by the government. And these are very essential questions, human questions we have to ask if we are looking at uh, educational equity, educational uh, consistency, wholeness, everything. So I'll stop at that. Um, so yeah, I, thank I, you. I, I, sorry, sorry, sorry. Guru. Uh, just to say, uh, if uh, I, I mean, rather than just sort of talk, you know, pontificate, I think I think it's important. To know what should we do? I think if the, the government has tremendous power and leverage, and if they could actually use the capacities and capabilities that so many of us in this group bring in and delegate responsibilities so that we are actually working with small groups of teachers, helping them uh, uh, develop their capacity to diagnose what the problems are with their individual groups of children. Uh, you can't uh, have one, a one size fits all for the entire state or for the entire nation. You will have to work on who are my children. So the teacher has to diagnose the problem for his or her children and then plan and prepare and then deliver, implement the, pl the plan and then uh, review, assess what worked, what didn't work, then uh, and, and continue the cycle. And for that, they need a lot of coaching and support and ongoing support and handholding. And that's where we could come in. I'll stop there. Yeah. Thanks, Maya. One very quick thing for uh, you, me and many of us who work in Karnataka is that we must do something specifically about the textbook revision and the hijab issues. Uh, I think many groups are protesting and we need to join them. Uh, so that is something maybe we should take up, uh, you know, after this, uh, maybe next yeah, week I, itself. I, I created, a, I did a podcast, I did a webinar with the education world. But um, yeah, and I, and I talk to whenever I'm working with groups of teachers, I bring it explicitly to discuss. Because I think yeah. teachers often sort of rub, uh, brush it under the carpet saying it's political. We don't have anything to do with politics. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, Mr. Raju has to leave now. So then we'll quickly hear him and then we'll have Kishore. Uh, Mr. Raju, please go ahead. Yeah. I thought I will, I will uh, make, uh, uh, I thought I will make one or two suggestions for the coalition. That is, it would be a good idea if the coalition can have interactions with the political leaders because I find that is a group that is uh, very ill informed about all these challenges because you don't find uh, this kind of uh, debates happening in the assemblies of parliament primarily because the uh, politicians are not exposed to these nuances. So coalition would be doing great service if it can uh, have a series of consultations with the various political party leaders so that they can be sensitized on all, on all these challenges. That is number one. Number two, today across the country, there are large number of social organizations of the marginalized sections. There are many Dalit organizations, OBC organizations. But if you see the kind of uh, uh, areas where they are working, they are working on many areas, but not on education. So it would be a good idea to, to, to have partnership with those organizations so that uh, uh, coalition can influence uh, uh, their thought process and help them to understand so that they can become uh, 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 great advocates for uh, securing better uh, quality access to education for marginalized sections. So these are the two suggestions I thought I can give to the coalition. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you okay, very okay. much, Mr. Raju. Yeah, Kishore next. But before that, uh, we will need your help also in making the connection that you spoke about now. So we'll be in touch with you uh, going forward. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Most welcome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. And Kishore, sorry, yeah. please come in. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I was, I am traveling. So I was in and out of the meeting. Uh, I just, I mean, I wanted to say that I mostly concur with what has been said so far. Uh, taking one point ahead of what Gita was saying, and I could hear only the first part of what she was saying, and which was very important, I felt, that this whole discourse on learning and learning loss, is it pushing us towards uh, digitization as 
perhaps the best and the most efficient kind of solution. Uh, one recent example I can give from Maharashtra is uh, Baiju's has signed a MOU with the minister uh, in in Davos in the World Economic Forum, and Baiju's now apparently is going to provide uh, its content free of cost to the children from uh, schools of Mumbai Municipal Corporation. And we all know that uh, in digital education provision of this kind, particularly when there is a for-profit company involved, there are no free provisions. And uh, what is the meaning of that freeness? That's one. Uh, but the other point I wanted uh, all of us to also think about is uh, to counter this discourse of uh, learning loss, we also need to talk about learning gain and how organically it is connected to children. Uh, what I mean by is uh, during the school closure, children also have acquired a lot of skills and a lot of uh, uh, cultural practices, which usually they would not, or which they would be kind of away from when they are in school. So these are related to labor. It is also true that this is not necessarily a very equalizing kind of labor, but children have learned a lot from their own environment, from their own kinship relationships and from their own parents and surrounding. What we perhaps also need to think of is when we are saying that the school should also address the experiences connected to COVID, which Jam was also uh, saying it strongly in his presentation. So connecting to that, I feel we also need to perhaps create learning experiences which are uh, bringing these learning gains of children and then perhaps taking them to uh, the learning to address the learning loss, which is primarily being thought in terms of uh, foundational literacy and numeracy, or, or maybe in the best case, it is about language and mathematics and nothing more than that. So to address the problem of learning loss, this kind of learning gain converted into classroom learning experiences uh, where children would be more encouraged to be in a participatory mode can perhaps help us address this problem of loss without being digital. That's a very important point uh, we need to bring in in the discourse. So this was just one point I wanted to raise right now. And since I'm traveling, I'll be off and on in the meeting. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kishore. So we have uh, half an hour left. So we have two uh, agenda items remaining. One is a very short presentation from Sajita on some tentative ideas on what we can do next. And we would welcome comments from uh, others on it. So that will take some time. And uh, on the edtech specifically, which uh, Kishore highlighted as a big risk, we have a slide to talk about some specific things that we can do on edtech itself. So, Anusha, will you open the slides for the NCE suggestions and Sajita can go ahead. Uh, I hope you can hear me and I hope uh, things will be a little better now. So, thank you for all the discussion. I think uh, what we've heard is what you know, what we have also said in a future of state, but equity should really be at the center of the recovery, uh, or whatever we want to call it, the education emergency addressing that. And that means very specifically, you know, you need to target resources, you need to give a better curriculum, better support, and so on. And I think it's very interesting who those groups are very large children in government schools, the local private schools, if you do a social composition analysis and we don't have that data, but everybody can see it from their own experience, it is the Dalits, the Adivasis, minorities, rural and urban poor, well, especially in the government schools. And roughly it's about you know, 200 million up to standard 12 and 131 million or so in government schools alone. Now, Youth by data for 2021 actually say that 4 million children shifted to government schools. It's possible, it's more than that. So, this is a lot of schooling destruction that is going on. Interstate migrant children that has been raised by Benoit, and uh, we, the reality is nobody knows how many there are. You know, the Supreme Court uh, ordered the numbers to be given, uh, but I don't think information has been provided for one year, you know. And you have children with special needs, children with disabilities, and of course, girls, you know, amongst all these groups were highly disadvantaged. So we need to know what is going on with them. Next slide, please. And, um, and then, 
we have a patchy picture of what the states are doing, as we discussed. It seems to us that Tamil Nadu is the one that has a two to three year plan for at least for foundational learning. It has a community based learning plan uh, program, which is like on, at scale. Uh, don't know the effectiveness, but at least it is going on for now for going to go on for one year. All these other things we listed in the future at stake, we, we don't get a feeling that all this is going on really, but we need to get information on that. Anusha, can you now skip to the um, slides on the NC book, please? Just, yeah. So next one, please. So I think we, we would like to, uh, what we are proposing, and you know, we have to take on board the many suggestions that have been made also. But how actually is this so called learning recovery, education recovery, or let's say how the addressal of this uh, education emergency, what is really happening? What is being, how is it being managed? What is a level of public funding? What are some good practices and lessons from different states? This is an area of focus. The second one we addressed a lot today is how is education addressing the agenda for social justice, reducing discrimination and exclusion as we think of a renewal of the education system, not just going back to what is uh, what is uh, what was there before, and how is technology being employed in government schools? Because as many people have said. Technology is being suggested as a panacea. It's not just I do. I think this personalized adaptive learning, for instance, is being rolled out in different states. With uh, we, you know, it's not even clear what the terms of the agreement are. But it's an issue of accountability, of funding, of oversight, of protection of students' data, and so on. And this is being done cover of addressing the education emergency, but holds really great dangers in terms of um, children's learning, children's social emotional development, greater stratification, and of course, you know, the use of data for possibly nefarious. Next slide, please. Um, we think that we should continue to be organizing our work under the education support and social mobilization. Um, education support, meaning sharing good materials from states, for instance, if Tamil Nadu is doing something which other states are not doing, let's create summaries of these experiences on the ground. You know, uh, let's share the materials of the Ennumeridum program materials. Now, of course, they may be in Tamil, but how do we get it across to other states? We would really like uh, suggestions about that, but there could be other good examples also. We just don't have enough of them. Um, review the teacher training approaches that have worked. Maya mentioned this, and I think we need to get more information on that, but it's not just the content, but it's also these attitudes that you mentioned, which if we don't surface those issues, then we're going to really just rebuild the whole education system, which is so divisive and has not succeeded in the past. And also we think that we need to document what states are and examinations, because as somebody said, it's a selection process essentially, essentially in leading out everybody else. You know, the national assessment just came out just recently. I don't know what they show, but, uh, but they probably are addressing what the real issues are. And the effort is being made to get everybody through examinations, but what will happen is these children will get this certification meaningless and which will lead to Deep social problems later. So we need to analyze those things. On the social mobilization front, we really need that, you know, we we'll make contact in several states. We would really like at least in five states that we have a real big mobilization of the public, especially of the social groups affected by the education emergency and youth. Work with NGOs and social organizations. Now Raju Sir, Binoy, and several others have suggested very concrete measures, so we will follow up with them. Um, there's the Kalam Satyagraha in Bihar, which 
uh, we hope can be a good model. Anyway, let's let's see how that will happen. We would really encourage having these state level meetings to broaden the kind of discussions that we are having. Um, the outreach to the media, nobody has really mentioned that, but I think this is really important and we need everybody to participate in that. We can help provide the information and so on, but we really need to make it a talking point. And then the outreach to the elected officials, because whether they're good or bad or not, they have a bully pulpit and at least a few of them, if they raise it in the legislature, uh, again, Rajasar has suggested some concrete things, but others who have those connections, it would be great to really work out a plan to do that. Um, next slide, please. And underpinning all this is the research that we have tried to do. And, you know, please recall everything we've done so far is purely voluntary and the efforts of individuals and organizations. We think that we should do this education emergency policy tracker, looking at what states are doing. Uh, the report on education financing in 2022-23 to really show how state governments have failed you know, in their duties and responsibilities to address, and the union government, to address the education emergency, perhaps some special surveys of migrant children, uh, high school students and of parents, and then the education technology tracker. So these are some of the thoughts uh, we've had, and I think it requires all our efforts. I think this is the last slide. And uh, it would be great to hear uh, responses from you about where you could help, what are some additional things that could be done? Thank you, Sajita. Uh, your audio was not very clear, but thankfully the slides were very clear. And I think the slides do cover many of the things that people have been speaking, different people have spoken about in this uh, discussions today. Uh, Jam has to leave, so I'll request Jam to come in and uh, uh, in a way, respond to all the discussions that have happened and also maybe specifically suggest in what ways the experience of Tamil Nadu can help uh, other states and other groups which are working there. Jan? Yeah. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, okay. Uh, oh, Jean, Jean, sorry, will you come in after Jam? Uh, I think my pronoun. Jean, just Jam must leave now, so just give two minutes to Jam and then. We'll be happy to hear you. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm sorry. My presentation, Jam, and then Jean. Yeah, but it's okay for Jean to come now. I mean, it's absolutely fine. I can wait. Yeah, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, uh, thanks very much. And I think uh, the range of comments that have come, uh, I think all are absolutely relevant. Um, and I think the what uh, Sajita was talking about, I think, uh, summarizes the responses and where we need to go, I think, very clearly. Um, it's, I think it's essential that the state uh, governments be engaged and uh, public mobilization uh, takes on, is taken on in a big way. The issues that uh, I think there is one area that I did not hear much about is I think uh, maybe a special emphasis on the middle school. I think there is an urgency that even while we talk about uh, foundational aspects, you know, uh, at the elementary level and the kind of uh, push that is happening at secondary high secondary level, mainly because of the examinations, the middle school seems to be something that uh, nobody seems to be caring much about. And I think their uh, children have just come from, uh, you know, uh, very, very young children have had primary school deception and have come to middle school and I think maybe that's an area that we should specifically focus on and uh, help uh, the system. This is one I want to say. And the second is something that Shantaji mentioned and it came in passing and uh, I, I would like to emphasize the role of teacher unions and teacher associations. I think uh, having conversations with them and mobilizing teacher unions, have uh, talking to them about the situation both in terms of it, I mean, it is mentioned in the context of it, uh, it tech and I responded to it as well. But it's not only that, because the sense of bewilderment that I was talking about and teachers responding to, you know, scissors applied in the syllabus and uh, 
acceleration and actually dealing with children who have had all these things. On the, on the whole, uh, it's not simply a matter of curriculum and pedagogy, it's about working conditions and it's about uh, associations taking a very clear stand on the role of the teacher and uh, how the state views the teacher. Uh, in private schools as well, this is a big problem. But I think uh, if you want to talk about equity, deepening inequity in this uh, situation, I think teacher associations have a very important role to play, and I would like to emphasize that as well. Yeah, these are points that I want to make. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, we'll be continuing to get ideas from the work that's actually happening in Tamil Nadu. And as multiple people mentioned, the kind of work on scale that Tamil Nadu is attempting is something that will be of great interest to all of us. Uh, request John to speak and also talk about uh, Jharkhand among the various things that he will uh, cover. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, yes, clearly. Yeah, I'm sorry. I thought you were asking me to speak. That's why I started speaking. But uh, I'll just add two minor points to what Sajita has said, because I think she covered most of the main points. Uh, the way I see it is I think the main issue is to create a pressure for change and for action. Because what is most striking about the situation today, it's not just that the situation is so bad. And, you know, being in Jharkhand, uh, I can tell you that it's really, really catastrophic. Uh, but what is striking is that so little is being done. And I think the reason for that, if we ask why is there no uh, incentive to change, I think, the, I think the main explanation is that the system is actually doing quite well for the privileged children. And indeed, uh, throughout this crisis, we have seen again and again that education policy was made for the privileged minority, whether it is the manner in which the schools have been closed for almost two years without batting an eyelid, whether it is the, re the complete reliance on uh, online education during that period, or whether it is the way we are going back to normal right now. Uh, what most children actually need right now, but it's not even being discussed, is some kind of full year of revision. But that, of course, is absolutely a no-no because the privileged children are on track and they don't want to be delayed and you can't have different policies for different children. So basically we continue uh, as usual. So, so I think the, uh, I think Sajita has made some good suggestions about how to try to create more pressure. So I think basically we, ne we have to try to be more active and more vocal. I'll just make two minor points on this. One is that I think the coalition needs to connect better with state level efforts and campaigns. Uh, it was very good to hear about this Kalam Satyagraha in Bihar. I'm not aware that there's anything like this in Jharkhand and I'm sure that in many states there isn't uh, any similar effort. So I think we have to try to facilitate state campaigns or connect with them and support them in some fashion. And more than five states, I think Sajita suggested five states, I think ideally all the states, but at least most of them, if at all possible. And the other point is, this I have discussed already with uh, Guru and Sajita, is that for this purpose, I think the one thing that would help is to have a clear and a short set of major demands, you know, things that people can understand and that conveys our position and what we feel needs to be done. Somebody wrote in the chat box that we know what needs to be done. Uh, I am not myself entirely clear because I think the system is so messed up, but I think we, we know some things that need to be done. So if we can put our heads together and put a kind of one page, uh, I wouldn't call it a manifesto, but some kind of uh, some kind of line that, that we are trying to advocate. I think that would really help to focus things and to get things going. So I'll stop here. Uh, thank you very much. I found the discussions extremely interesting and uh, I'll try to contribute as much as I can to all these efforts. Thank you. Jean, one more thing is uh, on the Tamil Nadu, you know, we haven't closed out on that uh, interstate meetings that we have talked about. I think again, Although there is a positive response from the uh, bureaucracy, I think we need to push a chase a little bit uh, with your help and uh, Jan's help. So that will that will also be a way of people, you know, state governments coming together formally, and then it helps the informal programs on the ground also to come together. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, 
we'll just quickly show a slide on edtech that we had because a lot of people did speak on edtech and then ranjini has raised her hand but before that anusha just can you talk very briefly on this yes uh, so at multiple points in the discussion the uh, issues that we are now seeing with edtech uh, were discussed so uh, what we had also thought of uh, was to you know focus uh, the efforts of the coalition uh, on the issues in edtech and uh, for this there were a few things we had planned uh, one is to um, you know organize a series of webinars uh, perhaps monthly this is mainly uh, because it's very important to uh, you know collaborate and uh, get a common understanding of uh, what really are the issues what is happening uh, in every state and we are already witnessing that uh, you know state governments are uh, going towards uh, investing more in edtech and looking digital technology as being the solution so to be able to counter that and also to uh, get an understanding of uh, what should be done right or you know what should, uh, what is the right way in which technology can be integrated uh, Uh, it is important to build uh, an understanding and for this we thought um, it would be useful to have a series of webinars with uh, you know individuals and organizations uh, with expertise in this field uh, and ad in addition to that uh, you know uh, research and advocacy uh, is very important uh, so with that in mind uh, to build awareness on uh, you know how edtech is really going to uh, impact students how it is impacting and uh teachers and school systems uh, you know what would be the relationship of teachers and technologies uh, what would be the ownership so these on these aspects it is very important uh, to uh, you know advocate and uh, build awareness um the third aspect is actually what uh, professor ramanujam had uh, highlighted uh, so there was a webinar uh, we had uh, conducted last month uh, called right digitalization in education uh, and this uh, was very useful to uh, you know set context on uh, what needs to be done what should be the broad principles uh, and the current issues um, a brief summary of this has been prepared i'm just sharing the link uh, in the chat window to this um so in this webinar uh, uh, professor ramanjum highlighted that you know uh, right now we have no uh, mechanism by which we can evaluate uh, any of the uh, edtech products or services that are there so uh, this is very important and this needs to be a collaborative uh, effort um, where edtech uh, products and services are evaluated you know considering their technological pedagogical political and economic parameters um so uh, we would need uh, you know the help and support of members in this group as well for this um and lastly on the research aspect uh, we uh, are planning to you know also Uh, uh conduct a uh, desk research to understand what are the different programs uh, that are happening in different states uh, and also uh, uh, do action research on uh, you know what are the possibilities uh, of you know some positive tech implementation so uh, uh, to study these uh, and we have also created a telegram group called uh, edtech india watch and then uh, so it's mainly to you know bring forth these discussions uh, regularly and uh, discuss i will also share the invite link to this group and uh, yeah that's uh, briefly what i had to say yeah thanks anusha so one immediate thing that we want to do is actually do a statement and a letter on the uh, byju maharashtra mou so we will draft something and we'll take inputs from everybody and i think we should try to make it as an example to have a larger protest against what maharashtra is doing if we are able to succeed here then it will influence other state governments from you know rushing into the same uh, process so that is something we should uh, consider immediately ranjini next um yeah thanks guru a uh, couple of points i mean many of the points have already been made and i really want to go back to what professor geeta was talking about in terms of resisting this narrative on learning loss because somehow that has been very neatly segueing into the whole discourse on ed tech and the biggest challenge is the stratification that the education system is already closing its eyes to will just become much 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 sharper with this ed tech because there will be a some set of people for whom a digital led uh, you know thing of basic reading and writing is deemed to be enough and the others will have a rich education and i think we just need to stop this discourse on learning loss because 
what is this artificial created emergency around learning and you know what time frame and all of that we really need to contest it we have to create a counter conversation and for that i want to say something specific a lot of us are coming with examples of what we have done here what someone's done there etc cetera, etc cetera. but i want to go back to what professor pravin uh, pravin singhra said that we need to really show something showcase it as a model as a pilot that has that can be seen as a possibility by um education systems that are at least willing to look at it like say even if you are wanting to go and say this to tamil nadu government we need to be able to say look if you do these 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 things you know they you know we can look at some of these things right now we have to move beyond the anecdotal um examples and exemplars into being able to formulate something to resist this narrative that is one thing that i wanted to say and perhaps with the collective experience of this group maybe we should be able to think of some way in which that narrative can be uh, built that's one the second thing i wanted to say is that we really also need to take on this larger nexus uh, this is a corporate driven thing and by that i just don't mean the byjus which is a immediate thing that's looming right in front of all of us and you know a letter and that's all great but what i really want to talk about is this whole nep push on vocationalizing um, education and not really vocational education because we are really not talking of building skills and meaningful employments through vocational education we are merely talking of skilling them quote and quote digitally so that they can do the low end jobs in the entire spectrum and this is a huge corporate push companies are buying into it csrs are buying into it and i and i'm not saying this and i don't want us to see it as out of context i see it as an entire connected argument and we really need to figure out a way to respond to this the latest argument that i'm hearing in csrs is that you know people don't even need to have degrees because we just need to find a job they can just take on a skilling course and take on a job so what we are really seeing in terms of the gig workers of the swiggy and the zomato and all of that we really want to extend it into all spectrums of um, you know human endeavor right right from engineering everybody doesn't need to be an engineer they don't need to be qualified to be an engineer or a doctor or whatever it is we are, so far nobody is talking of medicine thankfully but i really want us to understand what's going on at that level as well and this whole idea of life skills communicative english uh, getting on to platforms you know uh, nsdc coming on board with corporates i mean this whole thing is a large corporate driven um, you know technology uh, some, you know enabled nexus which we really need to take on uh, we need to see it as an entirety and respond to it that's what i wanted to add yeah uh, thank you ranjini so uh, purnima wanted to speak earlier and uh, i wanted the presentation to get over purnima would you like to come in and if anybody else wants to speak uh, please use a raise hand method we are at 5 so, to yeah. 6 now so we should be winding soon but purnima go ahead yeah so like i would say that like uh, if there is like uh, what we would like help in what way we could help if that is like uh, done by the coalition i'll be very happy to join whatever help need, required that's all i just want to say that Mm. Purnima, that's a very, very wonderful way of uh, ending this call because you know that's what we hope that after all the discussions we've had, which have been very rich and very good and very powerful, we also need to go ahead in terms of specific actions on the different fronts that uh, Sajita mentioned in her presentation. So uh, certainly, on many of them, we look for uh, support and participation from all the people on this call, as well as you know we need to expand this group. We have been talking about also talking to politicians. Okay. teachers unions etc etc community groups migrant workers uh, farmers all kinds of constituencies we have been mentioning whose interest very much echo what we have been talking about so uh, thank you so much for the offer of el purnima we will keep uh, connected uh, through the telegram group i don't think you are part of the telegram group so uh, maybe you should become a part of that so we'll help you get into that everybody else who is not a part of the telegram group we have a telegram group called the addressing education emergency so Uh, of course we meet like this very rarely this is the second meeting we've had of this kind but the telegram group is a way of uh, keeping in touch on a more regular basis apart from of course mails and the occasional newsletters that we send so purnima thank you very much for that offer yeah anybody else would like to come in anybody else wants to speak yeah so uh, pretty much what i spoke just now was in term yeah ranjini go ahead yeah guru 
I just wanted to ask, you know, if you could circulate uh, something like, you know, the action, immediate action points and ask people to take on specific things because we are really taking on a lot, talking of a lot of advocacy areas and, you know, everybody can't do everything, but we may need to act on multiple things at the same time and people should sign up for it and, you know, go forward in those smaller groups. It might be a useful thing to take this forward, right? I mean, um, you know, bringing things together, documenting together or, you know, writing about, you know, assessing, developing a framework for it. There is so much that has come up. So perhaps specific people can take on specific things. Maybe a call to the same group that or they on the Telegram group or wherever you want to do it. That might be useful. Thanks, Ranjani. Ranjani herself uh, has been, you know, supporting similar things that we have done in the Tamil Nadu work. The One of the reasons we are all aware of it is the kind of sharing that Ranjani and Jam have been doing. So, yes, I think that is what we need to do uh, going forward. Uh, we will figure out uh, some way by which people who are interested in specific areas are able to get engaged in it. And uh, then yeah, can we can I take activity forward. Point, in the group. Okay. I think one, can I just make one point here? See, since you brought up Tamil Nadu, the one thing I really want to say is, um, of course, the, the, the political and the general environment in Tamil Nadu was very conducive. But what also helped was that at all points of time, at every point, we were also being consistently making these points about uh, you know, learning being happening in a more organic way and not talk of the learning loss. And as we speak, in fact, the Anumaratham program has, the teacher's training has begun, you know, as of this week. And we are really talking of uh, the system, looking at it in a more activity-based way, giving children the time and space to learn and so on. So it's not all bleak and gloomy. But I really think that wherever we are, I think engaging with the state education departments to drive home this point repeatedly, uh, either in our individual organizations' capacities or through this coalition, I think that uh, is an essential next step because all of us can't take on all the entirety, you know, the entire country. But I'm sure in our little, in our little spaces, we should be able to influence SCRT because Telangana there is a problem. In Andhra Pradesh, uh, they're talking of English medium schools, right? And so I know that where we are working in Andhra. Children are very confused because they're coming to class three. They don't know Telugu, but they're being forced to read English and teachers can't teach and so on. So there are different spaces in which we should take this argument forward. And each one of us, I think, can also you know, sign up to do that, if I may say. So I think that's what I wanted to add. Thank you, Ranjan. If uh, anybody has anything else you want to say, you want to respond to anybody else, you want to make a point that's not been made earlier, you can put up um, your hand or you can I, unmute and speak. Go ahead, Sajita. Yeah, yeah. So I just want to pick up on what Sean suggested. I think I think it would be great to develop a set of demands, uh, you know, which because I, as I said earlier, one of the problem is people are not articulating clearly, you know, the public, the so is not they're not articulating clearly what is required. And as Raju sir said, you know, when you talk individually to people, any survey will show that people want to, they care most about the education of their children. Yet when it comes to the public space, poor people don't feel that they can articulate what they need. So the right to education is really not internalized. So we have to really be able to put together, I think, uh, uh, a set of demands and I talked to Anand Sab also about this that we should like as part of the Bihar uh, Satyagraha the Kalam Satyagraha really articulate demands that are iterated with ordinary people that they understand what it means and they're willing to raise it and that should also be raised in different uh, places and we will have to deal with some with some uncomfortable issues. I feel the issue of discrimination and prejudice, the issue of violence now increasingly and exclusion. And I think we have to face those head on because otherwise, I mean, this education system and even this society is not going to really survive, right? So we have to deal with those things. So that would be my concrete suggestion to follow up also on what Sean said. Thank you, Sajita. Would anybody else like to speak? Have the last word. Uh, 
thank you everybody for your uh, wonderful participation we have got lots of ideas of course immediately we will try to make a document which will highlight the action items that have come from the discussions some we had already an idea and that's what sajita presented but many more have come and also some ideas have been shared in some level of detail so thank you all for your suggestions and participation and again i invite all the people who are not a part of the telegram groups one on the addressing education emergency which is a broader a uh, group for all issues connected to the emergency and one edtech which is more specific to issues on edtech because we do see that that's going to be an area where we will have a lot of problems and we need to respond to it and also suggest in what ways the state can actually engage meaningfully with technology so that is one area that we are going to be certainly working on over the next few months and people are invited and uh, invited to join either or both groups based on their interest as well as their ability to uh, provide energies to that process Uh, I'll close the meeting now. Uh, thank you, everybody, once again, and we'll be in touch on the Telegram group and on mails, and occasionally we will also have the newsletters that will share the work that we are doing. Thank you, everybody. and how is it being treated in the government schools i think that contrast will help to also energize people yeah that, yeah know, yeah those kids are getting this kind of protection mm. and support and all that and we are mm. getting this really shitty you know yeah. <laughs> like third rate uh, useless stuff and i think mm. if we can i mean i don't know if byju's is used by your typical elite uh, school if it is mm. uma is it? uma uma responded and said that uh, no actually by juice you know it's also a paradoxical thing because the same you can analyze the same issue in so many different ways uma said that by juice is so much made for the elite people uh, that the people who are in the government schools cannot at all relate to it you know in terms of culture language and context the point you are making is the elite will never use byjus as a primary way of learning it will be some one tenth uh, the tenth thing on the list of things that they do for the poor exactly. it is the first thing on the list exactly but on the other hand that is true but the converse also is true that byjus is not actually made for the poor or the marginalized because that is not the market for them so, so you are so that's uh, the, the, so the 10th the 10th rate the 10th rate product of the rich is being given as a first rate product to the poor so that is the problem yes So let's mm. but let's highlight that you know maybe yeah, yeah. we and just you know also something. when we say free by by just is doing it because you know what happens uh, and this is something that when i did the ifc study you know such that became very clear the the free thing is only to get your yeah. data so that then people will hound you yeah. for the business so yeah. upgrade has been calling me jain college has been calling me all because i went to the site of upgrade once and said i'm interested in a ba B, bba course or something like that and i get a call like uh, so many calls so when maharashtra government is giving the data of these students what right does the maharashtra government have to expose the children and the data that they and their families exactly. have because why exactly. will collect the parents data and start hounding them uh, saying that we will change your child's life you enroll for this 60000 uh, product which you can pay over 10 years you know uh, 
exactly. which is which is what they do you know so the free thing the exploitation thing all has to be completely debunked uh, ideally we should make such a case study of it is that uh, any government will think going to baijus is a bad thing you know at some point in time it it it, it has in the past to some things right you know something gets so bad mouth that people don't want to touch touch it later on which is what we should try and do it's not easy because uh, like jam said uh, jam says you know even in tamil nadu with all the you know respect that uh, he has and the wonderful work that tnsf and others are doing he says baiju sir google can straight away go and meet the min- chief yeah. minister or the finance minister you know we will be meeting at uh, 10 levels lower than them yeah. uh, that is the that's a problem so so yeah, edtech is something that we will certainly take up uh, sajita on a on a, on a, on a in a strong yeah. way Mm-hmm. and you know but I the other parts are the bigger challenge the social mobilization continues to be a big challenge in the sense that everybody knows it's important but we don't have a we not resource for that yeah we'll have to think through mm-hmm. how to mm-hmm. uh, how to uh, i mean i think a couple of people have three people at least three who we should mm-hmm. follow up with okay and there may be mm-hmm. others i'm uh, mm-hmm. sapriti shubra didn't couldn't speak but I was shubra i'm very sad she was there and when i called her she had dropped off so that's a very I sad know. she would have been yeah. very good for the you know um, maybe we can talk so, to her anyway raju is one to collect us mm-hmm. connect us to things then benoy is mm-hmm. another i think we have to follow up and then the bihar uh, uh, people i mean Mm. okay for well, whatever it's worth they are doing something so no no certainly it's important you know yeah. that uh, the whole jayaprakash narayan thing started in bihar only i don't I know, know. You, there's a wonderful book written on nitish kumar and lalu it's called the brothers bihar you know it's uh, it's modeled after that you know what were karamazo brothers that uh, some uh-huh. russian one of those russian yes. authors wrote That's so yes. sankarshan thakur uh, so sankarshan thakur was a uh, Bihar political watcher uh, wrote this book called, called the B- Brothers Bihari which I've read it's a wonderful book talking about both Lalu Prasad and uh, Nitish and the whole 77 things started from Bihar only you know so yeah. therefore uh, ideally Bihar should be you know the whole people's movement to claim education yeah could and have I think start we, we can also help them and guide them also so uh, so mm-hmm. at least these three fronts Mm. on the social mobilization if we can help with that that mm. would be great um, mm. anyway uh, how many people attended a lot quite a lot a lot more than last time i think at least 50 i think uh, all put together yeah. it was I right saved it, but, yeah even i saved it at multiple points but multiple times, sure, yeah. yeah it was around 48 at one point and it was varying so i'm sure there were more than 50 uh, mm. yeah mm. yeah it's more much more and a lot more uh pointed interventions i think about yeah yeah what is yeah. going on so okay okay we'll <laughs> touch base lot of work sajita lot of work we to think how to do that yeah. tech and you know a tech will certainly sphere it so i think we will see some action on that and many people are very interested in tech also uh so therefore edtech will certainly move the mobilization is very important so we should really as you said on the three areas we should really try and push it yeah and on the education support i think mm. uh, we, we should have maybe a follow up call with shubhra and vinita and uh, ranjani i think mm. we're still on and you know yeah, how, yeah. what exactly should be done and what should be we be focusing yeah. on it, you know yeah. how much relative importance to what state governments are doing what ngos are doing do we mm. up, update our our uh, what do you call it uh, this website etc i think mm. those things need to be discussed mm. did, did the person from unicef attend no he didn't attend oh. at least i didn't see him at all begur he had said he would attend but i don't think i don't i don't remember seeing him at all in the call because i think having a call with unicef also might be mm. helpful uh, yeah yeah now we have to go to more specific things with unicef as in twice i have spoken to him yeah so next okay. time we speak to him you should also be there and maybe make yeah. some very specific suggestions tamil nadu good thing is it for change is going to work with tamil nadu uh, education okay. department uh, along with tnsf so i i told you i had gone to chennai yeah. um with Ra- met ranjini and ramanujam and then we met spd uh, 
they're really committed to the social justice thing that we are talking about, you know, in the sense that the pedagogy is very crucial, but they, they look at it very clearly as a larger thing than that. And Tuesday, we have a call with the commissioner, the Ennemaitam program, which Jam talked about, we are looking at a kind of a portal to bring the learnings from that into the public domain. So, unfortunately, it will be entirely in Tamil, but Ranjini has volunteered to, you know, excerpt the learnings from the Ennemaitam program for the other states. So that is something we'll be engaged with on an ongoing basis as a part of the regular work we do in IT for change. So Tamil Nadu social, that education support Tamil Nadu thing, we will keep surfacing. Right. Kerala, of course, is perfect, so they don't have any recovery. Anusha and Marzia have already shared that document with you. That Kerala is at a state that there was no need to do any recovery at all. <laughs> we believe them, Sajita. You are, out, you are outvoted. Anusha, Marzia and I believe very much what the Kerala government says. No, Anusha? You, you are just propagandized. <laughs> Sajita is a cynical pessimist as far as Kerala is concerned. Well, I mean, you, you are, are just... the person speaking from the coastal <laughs> children. We are enam, yeah, Amjad. What is, know, where does he work? Where does he work? He, he works in the, uh, amongst the coastal children in uh, uh, Trivandrum district. It's near the mm -hmm. estuary, Modalapuri. And mm -hmm. uh, in the little village, fishing village, where a harbor has mm -hmm. come, and uh, mm -hmm. they work with 200 children. And he, he was mm -hmm. saying that when yeah, I asked him yeah. what's the impact of COVID, he said, you know, to tell you the truth, mm -hmm. uh, they, they weren't learning anything before. Everything. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, they come to our evening classes. And mm -hmm. then it's become hard in COVID, of course, because nothing was allowed. So to yeah. Just re-engage with them was difficult. We destroyed That's, India in two years. Mm. Yeah, we destroyed, destroyed India. It. Mm. Destroyed it and mm. and made it. You see, people think education is a privilege. That's that's mm. the thing. Mm. You know, they don't think mm. they have lost anything. Yeah. They think that uh, milgya to thik philosophy. You know, you're on your own. You're mm. on your own, and mm. it's your fate, and mm. it's. If you get it, it's all right. If you don't, you know, mm. what can you do? Yeah. So that mm. concept of right has not been internalized. Yeah. What yeah, really absolutely. is not right? Mm. And so in that sense, yes, we are dealing with very deep, um, deep-rooted problems. It's not a technical fix. Yeah, yeah, not at all. No. So... Maybe be, who knows? Maybe Bihar yeah. being at the worst, and let's Actually, din it to them. They are the yeah. worst. Maybe they yeah. can make a difference. Actually, Tejasvi campaigned only on that. You know, every time I used to see Tejasvi on TV, I mean, he almost won, and it's very sad that the Congress didn't really, yeah. you know, support him as, as much. He would only talk about Palayan. You know, Palayan, I think, is the Hindi word for migration. That was his primary election yeah. campaign thing. Yeah. You know, so, but Tejasvi and these are not, RJD is not at all a part of this Kalam Satyagra. I don't know why. They should be roped so, in also. So, no? what Manisha said is that our, it's not part of RJD's issues. Okay. Really? So, and Yo. yeah, she said it's not. But, and now if these people start and some of them are associated with Congress and they'll say, oh, we have to keep them mm -hmm. out. And I said, what about the leftists? You know, uh, mm -hmm. why don't we uh, involve, mm -hmm. why aren't they? So she said that sh that should be possible because they would be concerned. Mm. So yes. I think we have to find out more from Anand mm. and it will require somebody to work with them. Okay, I, I want to let Jasmine go also, but Guru, just mm. to say that um, Jasmine did, you know, a lot of... <laughs> Lovely slides. Even yeah. though you didn't speak, the slides spoke, Sajita. Yeah, I'm so sorry mm. about all this. I think it was just the platform was not able to... I mean, I was not able to connect to the platform repeatedly, mm -hmm. but um, mm -hmm. we, we do intend to try and see what we can do on the education finance thing. Jasmine mm -hmm. has to follow up on a, a one, Kerala state government budget, at least, and then maybe Bihar, I can ask uh, uh, Anand to try and get that so that we can see mm -hmm. if and get the Hindi and I think you said Karnataka one also has English is it yeah Karnataka one has English so we Karnataka if we may can, have some we can try if you can direct her to mm. where she can get the English budget for Karnataka mm -hmm. then 
we can mm. at least do for a few states and not a lot, but just mm -hmm. find out what are they spending on and where, where do you even find what they're spending on technology? I'm sure that is hidden. I don't believe that. We should do RTA. Every state government send an RTA. Are you doing a contract or MOU with any tech company? Yeah, no, but we, not a, of course, but we should, should find, this should be public mm. documentation. Anyway, it should not require an RTI. I if know, you're but they won't money, share. No, but where do they hide it in the budget? Is there's no budget head? Budget, it won't be big enough to mention the budget. They will just put it as an item under, you know, quality improvement program. They'll really? put some several crores for quality improvement and buy the software under that. So, it will, really? they will not spend, yeah, they will not put a separate item for any software purchase. It will not come. Okay, let's explore anyway. Jasmine, mm -hmm. look at the Kerala government one. And also, I think because the KITE, uh, the Kerala Infrastructure for in Technology for Education, that might be a separate budget. Just see if you can get that also. And, uh, we, you know, I think Jam's thing about the middle school children, you know, in the high mm -hmm. school, it's really important. So we'll try and talk to these kids in the uh, Kerala schools to see how to develop a survey instrument and mm. uh, then see if we can replicate that in Bihar and a few places, you know, uh, mm. just to see what we can do. I know it's a lot of work. We'll have to think how to mm. <laughs> organize We must it. do it, of course. We must do it. It's the most important thing to do. So we should do it. We should, and mm. we should get a few more, uh, mm. yeah. People. Anusha's and Marzia's and Jasmine's also. Yeah. yeah. And how is Marzia, by the way? Marzia was recovering. No, I didn't speak to her afterwards, but she's on a two day offsite in some program. That's why she was not able to come in today. So, how is she, Anusha? Any idea? Uh, no, even I spoke to her only, I mean, yesterday. I, that's why she was recovering. Uh, but I think today and tomorrow she's in that. Uh, uh, not retreat, but some digital detox. I mean, she doesn't have access to uh, her mobile and also that's why she couldn't. Is detox uh, the aim of that program or detox is the incidental no. aspect of the program? Uh, I'm not sure. No, I don't think that's the main <laughs> intention of the program, but it's mm -hmm. like a part of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Sajita, one of the things that Marcia has been, you know, we've been talking slightly lightly is the speech studies thing. She did some work uh, when she was in APU in peace studies with Professor Aman Madan. So, you know, uh, what our Binoy was talking about, you know, how do you counter the uh, issues that are happening in Karnataka, Kerala and all. I think peace studies is the uh, proactive way of... Yeah, so the proactive way of addressing that is what is called peace studies. I mean, to uh, bring the idea of tolerance and all not in a preachy way, but in a kind of a, you know, reflective, experiential way. So that is something that also, is, I mean, that's very important because uh, uh, young people are being polarized now. So that's something important. To do. I think we have to have a meeting on that or, a, mm. you know, really mm. have it out in the open because, you know, there's mm. some of these things which, which uh, Raju also raised about how, you know, the prejudice and, uh, overt discrimination um, against Dalits, right? That mm -hmm. now this increasing violence. I mean, mm. it's it's something that one has to really talk about that this has to be opposed. And mm. Maya said, I mean, she's brave to raise these issues. Maya is very courageous on Twitter. She yeah. tweets stuff that yeah. I don't tweet. Yeah, and she is raising I'm very careful on Twitter. Mm. But uh, it has to be raised. And I think even yeah. these Teach for India people, we have to mm. approach them and say, look, are you checking what your uh, teaching aides and all are doing? Because mm. I heard from people, research assistants that work with me, who had been TFA, assist, you know, teachers, uh, Teach for TFI teachers, uh, saying that uh, they were shocked when the CAA protests were going on. What mm. these teaching aides are uh, saying, mm. you know? mm. and because they're not under the government, I mean, of course, that doesn't make much difference now, but uh, mm. 
you know, government rules may prevent you from saying certain things openly, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but we, now they're not under that. They, they're just so open about it. And I think these people have to be pushed to say, well, mm -hmm. what stand are you taking on that? You know, mm -hmm. I, I think both on the issue of discrimination and exclusion and this question of violence and communalization, mm -hmm. uh, we have to we have to push people to uh, while mm, building mm. a broad coalition, you know, to say yeah. that that's really not acceptable, you know. And this mm, is where mm. I think the international organizations. I keep saying it; they have to be yeah, put on yeah. the spot. They have to be yes, put absolutely. on the spot. Mm. You know, you don't wait till the genocide happens and then mm, say mm. we won't do it. But even the U.S. government is doing nothing, saying nothing. Because they want India on their side, right, against this. Mm -hmm. uh, China. China, allegedly, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Allegedly, big yeah. Geo big geopolitics involved. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why I sent you that article from The Economist. I was just so shocked to mm -hmm. see how they're praising. They're you know, stupid. There are some it's comments on it to say it's baseless. Simply they interviewed some stock market managers and, you know, concluded that everything is great. Yeah. Really nonsense. Yeah. But I Complete think they're nonsense. trying to curry favor, you know, mm -hmm. to say it's with Modi government because they think for the elections they have to back him, you know. So mm -hmm. that's that's what's going on. Mm -hmm. yeah, we've got our backs against the wall. <laughs> definitely. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but, so anything else or we will make this document and we will discuss it you know the action items and all like anusha said yeah, from yeah. a transcript of the video we'll get that and we'll work out from that okay, okay. thank you yeah. anusha thank you anusha anything oh, from your side anusha uh no guru okay. thank you anusha thank you jasmine if jasmine is there and thank you ranjini if ranjini is there ranjini is on a break in year card so she may not have disconnected, but she may not be on the call. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Then. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye, bye. 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 Bye.